Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start the. Pode, eu já tinha pedido, eu acho. Let's start the the second uh, round table uh, about external savings, investment, and exchange rate. We will have. We are very happy and and uh, we have the pleasure to have Eliana Araújo from UEM, Fabricio Mício from FMG, Luiz Fernando de Paula from UFRJ, and Nelson Marconi here from the, the house. Uh, I have to read the disclaimer again. Uh, so all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employee and guests in our online event and broadcast exclusively represent their opinion, not necessarily FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded this broadcast, which will be posted later on FGV official channels. To continue with the transmission, we ask that uh, you express your agreement by verbalizing uh, or signalizing your agreement. Uh, You can submit questions uh, to this webinar via sl slido.com. Uh, the link to participate is at the beginning of the description of the video. Uh, also, we have, uh, I have to read here a notice regarding image and voice recording. This event may, be, may collect our personal data and record our image and voice through photographs and video in accordance with the applicable laws. You have the option to refrain from participating, and if you have any questions, please contact FGV through the data protection section at port, uh, portal.fgv.br. That's it. Uh, <laughs> please, uh, uh, let's start with Eliane. Eli, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Your presentation is here. Uh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I will present some highlights on a comparative analysis of the commercial and financial liberalization process uh, of Latin America and Asia. Um, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present uh, some results of my research in this a very interesting workshop organized by the Center of New Developmentalism. Um, this, this are, uh, I represent on only some ideas. It's not a paper, but it's based uh, main, uh, on a paper that I wrote uh, with Professor Bresser Pereira entitled An Alternative to the Middle Income Trap that was published at the, uh, in the journal Structural Change and Economic Dynamic. And uh, uh, actually, I tried to write a paper about the subject of, of this section, but uh, I could only uh, to, uh, until now I have only a, a database, but uh, I will try to write something uh, if uh, countries can rely on foreign save. But uh, now I have the data and up I updated our paper to show some data about the, the idea of the section. Um, I divide, um, so the, I'm sorry, the objective of my presentation is uh, to analyze the process of commercial and uh, financial opening in Latin America and Asia in the post 90 uh, with the purpose of identifying its effect on ec interest rate, uh, external saving, exchange rate, competitiveness of the manufacturing and uh, foreign trade. I divided the presentation in four main parts. The first part, I will try to uh, summarize the process of financial and uh, uh, com ah, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, I'm 
in the wrong slide. Okay, here. I divide the presentation in four different parts. The first one, I will present some characteristics of the commercial and financial liberalization process in Latin American Asia. Then I will present uh, uh, some indicators of the financial and commercial uh, liberali li liberalization process in the two regions. Then I will try to present some data um, and uh, some effects of these policies in some uh, macroeconomic variables, and then some concluding remarks. Only to summarize, as I, as I told you um, in the paper that I have with Professor Bresser, uh, we have a good summary of these policies, uh, but uh, I will discuss only some similarities and some difference regarding the the liberalizing reforms pursued by these two regions. Uh, as for the commercial liberalization, uh, we can see that uh, there was a greater gradualism on the part of Asian countries who even raised their tariffs between the late 80s and early 90s. In the case of Asian countries, there is a more selective and vertical protection strategy within the manufacturing sector. And uh, despite the greater uh, tariff protection of Asian, they significantly increased their degree of trade openness in the period, especially due to the growth of in exports. And this is very different from the Latin American countries. Oh, I'm sorry. As for the uh, financial liberalization, we can say that uh, there was, uh, in, the, in the case of Asian countries, there was a more cautious financial integration strategy uh, as when compared to Latin American countries that adopted a rapid deregulation in the early 90s. Both regions increased the degree of financial integration. However, in Latin American countries, there is integration into international markets with a predominance of finance over the real sector, indicating a potentially more vulnerable insertion to change in the external situation, and the opposite occurred in uh, Asian economies. So these are only um, uh, a, 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 the main idea, and you can find more uh, information in the paper that I cited. And uh, now we can... Uh, we can turn to the main characteristics of the commercial and financial liberalization in these two regions. And um, uh, I will present some data to try to illustrate the idea. Uh, in this uh, first figure, we have the exports of goods and services as a, a share of GDP. Um, in the case of Latin America, we have uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, and Peru. And uh, for Asia, we have China, India, Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And um, uh, in addition to, to show the two groups of countries, I also highlight uh, the two major economies in each of these regions. Uh, in case of Latin America, I will highlight Brazil and Mexico, and in case of Asia, I will highlight China and South Korea. So, uh, as we can see in this figure, there is a, a growing trend in the share of exports of goods and services in Asia. And uh, I don't know if you <laughs> are, you can see, but uh, uh, it was always it was al always higher than the Latin America. So we have uh, here Latin American countries and here Asian countries. Uh, the exception is Mexico, but uh, I don't know if he's a false exception. I will talk about it later. Um, and uh, another complementary indicator we have in this second picture, that is the trade opening. Um, as we can see, uh, again, the, the, the two regions and uh, highlighting Brazil, Mexico, and uh, South Korea, and uh, China. Uh, as we can see, despite of the higher 
tariff protection for the average Asian economies compared to Latin America, up until the beginning of the 20s, there is an accelerated increase in the opening coefficient of Asian economy to international trade between 1985 to 1999 and um, are relatively closer after 2005. And uh, we can see that uh, in Latin America, the, the opening index, this uh, trade openness was always smaller than that of Asian countries. Now, I will present uh, uh, characteristics of uh, financial uh, liberalization. Uh, this graph show, presents the international financial, in financial integration by considering the aggregate financial flows in terms of the trade flow. So this is presented in the, the figure. Um, Mexico aside, as we can see, the behavior is a bit different, but we can see that the indicator reveals a distancing from the average of Latin America and Brazil, especially with respect to Asian countries, evidencing an insertion in the global economy based mainly on financial openness to the detriment of trade. In the we have here the Latin America and Brazil and Asian countries, so uh, we have this insertion in the part of Latin American countries that is based on financial uh, integration different from the Asian countries. Uh, as a consequence, as trying to, to talk about um, some effects of this uh, financial and commercial policy on Latin America and Asia, uh, we, can, we can summarize as a result of this process of uh, commercial and financial liberalization for Latin American countries that on average they have, and I will show some data about it, that the Latin American countries um, have uh, more appreciated the exchange rate and a higher interest rate, greater imbalances in external accounts and greater vulnerability of uh, economic growth to external shocks, tendency to the industrialization or reduction in the participation of the manufacturing sector in total value added, and also uh, consolidation and even expansion of the dependence on export of primary goods. So I will show some data that maybe are consequence of the two reforms that I said uh, before, sorry, this is not the right. This is the first graph that illustrates what I am talking about. Uh, this figure show the, the real interest rate, the average for Latin American countries and for Asia. And uh, as we can see, um, there is a higher real interest rate differential in Latin America when compared to Asian economies. And also, if we look at the exchange rate behavior, we can see a uh, more appreciated uh, trend in real exchange rate in Latin America compared to Asia dur during this period. And uh, considering the level of exchange rate and uh, interest rates that are key prices for, uh, for new developmentalism that uh, the section before uh, also uh, talk about. Uh, we, we can say, based on these two prices, interest rate and, uh, and exchange rate, we can say that the macroeconomic environment in this period post the reform seems to be more favorable, favorable to gross physical capital formation and export in Asia when compared to Latin American countries. Another, uh, uh, another slide uh, shows, this is not this one, I'm sorry, this one. <laughs> uh, in this figure we can observe also the evolution of the current account balance for Latin American countries in Asian as a percentage of GDP. 
and uh, we can say in the figure uh, we can see in this figure a uh, clear deterioration in the current account for Latin America, uh, which was uh, temporarily reversed during the commodity price boom. That uh, I think uh, I can't see. I'm sorry. I'm trying to point, but I, I can't see the numbers from here. I'm sorry. Um, in contrast, there is a strong growth in the current account balance um, in Asian countries, as we can see in the in these lines here. So, uh, while in Latin America we are uh, rely on uh, foreign save, in the case of Asian is the situation is very different. Um, another uh, another figure uh, that shows the evolution of net foreign liabilities in these two regions for Latin America and Asia. And we can observe that the Asian economies showed uh, a significant reduction of their net foreign liabilities from the 2000s, which even uh, became negative in China and South Korea, as we can see here. And then uh, we can see uh, another result of this uh, policy is, is, is illustrated in this picture that uh, uh, shows the evolution of the manufacturing share in total value added. As we can see in the beginning of the the, peri the period that we start the graph, that is 1990, the major economies are almost in the same level. Brazil, China, South Korea, and uh, uh, Mexico. But uh, uh, then, uh, going forward, there was strong growth in the, in the manufacturing industry for Asian countries followed by stabilization at levels much higher than those observed in Latin America. And this is in, in the right uh, X, we have only the uh, value added of Latin America divided by Asian, and we can see this the word trend here. I don't know if you understand, I hope so. <laughs> and um, as a consequence of this process of the industrialization, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the export basket in Latin American countries moved for unsophisticated goods with increased uh, the dependency on commodity exports. The exception is Mexico, but uh, maybe it is a false exception because the uh, manufacturing industry that was reduced to the status of maquilas that uh, import the main components for other countries. And uh, trying to conclude and relate to the new developmentalism theory, uh, we can say that uh, in this period, from the period that I showed the data from, from the 9th to 2022, trade and financial openness brought important negative impacts to Latin American countries compared to Asian countries, while uh, East Asian countries already exported uh, manufactured goods and were relatively open. Latin American countries adopted trade liberalization that dismantled the pragmatic mechanism that were embedded in the trading system. And the financial liberalization, in turn, uh, limited its ability to control capital flows, facilitating the rise in interest rate and depreciation of the exchange rate, as I show with in the pictures. And uh, trying to relate this data with the new developmentalism, um, we can uh, say that uh, uh, the new developmentalism, this, this presentation is aligned with, with this uh, theory, which draws attention to the distortion um, in the main macroeconomic prices, as I told you, as I told you, exchange rate and interest rate, uh, that in developing countries uh, suffer from the the uh, access to the greater uh, international capital flows and the use of external saving. 
And uh, from this perspective, the behavior of exchange rate and interest rate in a context of greater financial integration may comprise the microeconomic condition necessary for the expansion of investment and uh, structural change in developing countries. And uh, this macroeconomic distortion can even uh, induce structural regression, as I show I showed in the, the tables. Uh, in developing countries, in Latin America, in Brazil. And uh, these are potential adverse effects on the... Uh, with potential and adverse effects on the balance of payment and the economic growth. So, um, as I told you, it's not a, a, a paper, it's some ideas based on that paper that I, I published with Professor Bresser. I'm always trying to write something if countries can rely on foreign save, but I presented only some ideas in attempt to contribute to with this section. I hope to add something, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. If any of you have any comments or questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. First, uh, I would like to say thank you, Professor Besser, Marconi, Thiago, for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I have uh, my presentation about investment social change, real exchange rate, and economic growth in developing countries. Uh, in fact, this presentation is about uh, uh, my concern to highlight some uh, transmission channels about the effect, the real exchange rate on economic growth. And this is not a paper, this is a research agenda. So I have some uh, finds theoretical here and uh, some empirical uh, finds in my, my last workers, okay? Uh, uh, I have put, I think, uh, more, uh, much more information in my slides because my English is not good enough, so, uh, I hope that in one way or another you can understand me. Okay, let's start. Uh, of course, this is uh, there is nothing new here. Is uh, just the the first slide. Some points to start. Né? Our research is grounded in three main theoretical reference: structuralism, economic theory, balance of payment constraint growth model. Of course, new development list, and then né, economic growth results for a process of, of structural change. Structural change can be defined as a change uh, of the production system across the sectors. It, it's, it means changing participation of the sectors in the product composition. And then, né, for growth structural change, uh, is a shift toward modern tradable activities in product composition. In this context, if dynamics of production structure matter for the growth, the question is, what variables can promote structural change to our modern tra tradable activities? Né? This agenda seeks to show that the competitive real exchange rate is an important variable in this process for developing country. Okay, this is uh, my background model. Uh, here's an ugly equation behind this picture, but this is not important. Né? Uh, this is the model I have in my head when I work in this topic. The picture shows the long-term equilibrium and dynamics for the growth of developed country. Uh, we have two equations here. Né? The, capital, uh, the capital accumulation function is a nonlinear one. And uh, the growth rate with balance of payment restriction. Né? Uh, of course, this is so mathematical, mathemat mathematical model, but uh, the equation is not important. The important is the conclusion. Né? A competi competitive real exchange rate leads the to faster growth. This is the second equilibrium, the high equilibrium. Né? And uh, the overvaluated real exchange rate slow down the growth is the first one, né? the lower equilibrium. It's uh, just another way to see the central argument of the new development, development needs. 
the competitive reaction rate is important for economic growth. So this is just a, a, a formal model. Yeah? Uh, the next step is to look in more detail each equation of this model, the specif specify and missing transmission channels and empirical gaps. Why? Because there is a vast literature that shows the competitive real change rate positively affects the growth rate of developed countries. And uh, in this room, you have a great team. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is not applied to the literature on transmission channels. Uh, we need to move in this direction. So uh, let's zoom in more details this equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Bresser, uh, I agree with, e with you. Uh, this is external con constraint equation. We, it's mu much more Pripyat idea than zero law. But the zero law is just uh, uh, for, for convenience. <laughs> it's more easy to specify mathematical model and uh, regressions. Uh, and uh, you can dialogue with foreign researchers. It's just for convenience. Yeah. And it, uh, the main idea is the of the previous. Yeah. So uh, this equation here, yeah, the, the, the external constraints, I have some uh, ideas about this. Yeah. It's assumed that income elasticity of demand for export and export is an endogenous function of the level of real exchange rate, uh, as I can see in this equation. Uh, uh, of course, it's not direct effect, so because the uh, income elasticity, uh, in fact, is a function of the number of the goods produced by the country and uh, uh, the technological progress. Uh, so uh, real exchange rate affects direct the, the first one and uh, indirect the second one. So uh, in mathematical terms, it's, pos it's possible to rewrite the Prebsch zero law né, as you can see in this equation. Né, take the derivative, you can uh, uh, obtain, we obtain uh, this uh, positive derivative. But of course, this is uh, uh, just simple. Né? Uh, you can try, uh, you can apply the same idea in the multi-sectoral model. So in this multi-sectoral version of uh, previous zero law, with the endogenous elasticities, the growth rate of the domestic sector income is like this new equation. Again, it's ugly, but you can see uh, theta is the real exchange rate that. So you can uh, see the effect of the real exchange rate on the uh, gro uh, growth rate of the domestic sector. Uh, of course, uh, there is more simplification equation you can see uh, here. Né? It's more easy to understand my uh, main argument. So to simpli simplify, we can illustrate the effects of the real exchange rate on income elasticities of export in the mutual sector model like uh, this equation, né? and uh, easy to see, we have uh, three main effects in this. I, I will decompose this equation. So, so can we identify the effects of real exchange rate, rate on the income elasticity? And propose two main effects, né? the composed effect. A competitive exchange rate increases the share of the sport sectors with great income elasticities within the productive extruder. So uh, you can see the share is a function of the real exchange rate. You have another one effect, the sophistication effect. Uh, competitive real exchange rate increase the income elasticities of the goods produci produced in the domestic economy because the exchange rate affect the, uh, the extent of the technological progress embedded in these goods. Yeah. So uh, this is because the income elasticity is a function of the real exchange rate. And the last one is diversific diversification effect. A competitive real exchange rate increase the number of the exported goods. So uh, the number of this good is K, is a function of the, the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, in, in empirical terms, yeah, there is a limited empirical testing of elasticity and endogeneity. Most 
studies focus on examination the ratio between elasticities and uh, I'm sorry, Danilo, but uh, I don't like this. Eh? This approach doesn't make the channel clear. Uh, I think you need to uh, specify uh, different tests for the income elasticity for export and the income elasticity for importance. So uh, we needed some challenges here. Yeah? We acknowledge certain limitations in, in our ability to empirically, empirically test these relationships, including methodological constraints, data uh, available and changeless and isolation, isolating the effects of specific variables. But yeah, uh, uh, we have uh, some news uh, recently yeah, to move for for our, our this issue. Our main suggestion is to explore the variate response of individual products sectors to exchange rate. So you need to do uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to work with these uh, databases, so you need some help for technological programs for to extract this, this data and do this in econometrical terms. Né? Palacio Rapetti, né? 2023, 2023, uh, do this. Né? We can uh, we can try uh, alternative ways, né, which I call in, uh, indirect testing approach. There is a well-developed international and national literature in this area. Again, this many research in this room, né? and so I will uh, uh, present some results. Né? So our strategy is. As the effects of a real changing rate on income elasticities can be summarized as a structural change, you can define proxy variables for these changes and then test the impact of real exchange rate on them. So, so uh, just uh, some examples uh, in a paper written with Luciano Gabriel. Uh, uh, the main objective was show the show how exchange rate impacts different economic sectors and economic complexity in this. Uh, it means that we try to show uh, whether the exchange rate can induce a pro growth structural change. Uh, of course, I won't spend too much time of this. This is just a, a description of the variables. Uh, and here the, the equation tested. Uh, it's just a, a simple model. Né? Uh, we have uh, the, the sectors in the dependent vari variable. In the independent variable, you have a uh, index for uh, exchange rate disvaluation. So uh, we have this first result. As you can see, né? uh, the, coefi the coefficient has a correct signal and is statistical statistical significance. So uh, uh, show the real exchange rate can uh, promote the structural change in the direct correction. It's the same as for this, uh, uh, sorry, because I have three sectors. This is, is okay for uh, manufacturing. Is uh, correct direction for service. Uh, of course, for, for uh, sorry, for, uh, Setor primário, the primary sector, primary sector, and uh, not significant for the service sector. No? Uh, and here uh, you try you, you test the real exchange rate uh, versus uh, uh, index of complexity. The I highlight the coefficients again. You have the uh, right correction of the, the sign and the statistical significance. So conclusion, né? the real question rate can promote structural change towards the more complex economy. So uh, we have uh, some evidence that is uh, a true. And the second paper, uh, right with Hugo, uh, you do the same thing with different uh, databases, different specification of econometric models. Again, I, uh, I, I have uh, the summarized the results. Né? Uh, here, 
as you can see, the real exchange rate impacts the industrial sector in the, direct, in the correct direction and impact the complexity in this in the direct correction too. So again, the conclusion uh, is that real exchange rate can promote structural change towards the more complex economy. Uh, okay, but there is a second question in this my model. Né? Uh, the first one is the instant constraint. The second one is the uh, growth rate of investment or investment function. Né? In the model, uh, this equation has this uh, ugly face here, yeah, equation one. And so uh, in this equation, exchange rate depreciation has a positive effect on the competitiveness and profitability of trade goods sector. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, real exchange rate depreciation has the effect of drop real wage and increase the cost, the cost of imported inputs, including capital goods. We face two changes here. The, the, first, per, uh, the first pertains to limitation in the employed approach. This equation, specific, this equation specification only considers the direct effects on the income growth rate. And the second one is the empirical nature. Uh, some changes. Uh, estimated this equation empirical mean process several changes. First, because the equation is not linear. Second, we have good reasons to suspect is, is its limitation, primarily capture, capturing the direct effect on the real exchange rate on the trade sector. Uh, in practice, uh, it's likely that H is uh, distribution, the hand, uh, income, distribution. income and distribution is also influenced by the real exchange rate. In the, uh, in the other words, income distribution is affected by variation in the uh, real exchange rate level. So this opens a new door within this agenda. You know? If a profit is affected by real exchange rate, then we need to know, for example, what is the exchange rate passed through to the inflation, if, huge, if exchange rates affect real wage, whether real exchange affect the profit red rate or the share of the profit income. So this, this uh, transmission channel is not clear in the literature. I think you, you be more careful and uh, try to uh, do some econometric tests for uh, have uh, new evidence about this. In empirical terms, okay, this is a, a paper on the review. Uh, we empirical empirically investigate the influence exerted by the real exchange rate on investment in uh, 81 sectors of the Brazilian manufacturing industry. So I have some results here. Uh, we test this exportal channel, cost channel, and the import penetration channel. And uh, as you can see, just uh, sporting channel is significant, in, significant and uh, go in the uh, direction expect. Né? So uh, the sporting channel play a crucial role uh, and we don't have uh, more evidence and, and in this work, uh, we find some relevance of the cost of channel, but this is not uh, for all the estimative, it's just for <laughs> one, only one. In a second paper on review, we empirically investigate the influence of real exchange rate pass through on prices in the manufacturing sectors of the Brazilian economy. And, and uh, of course, it, uh, I highlight the results for the, all the, the sectors. The conclusion is, uh, result for the pass-through for 1% of exchange rate devaluation. Few sectors have a pass-through uh, greater than 15%. The vast majority have a pass-through of less than uh, 15%. So uh, uh, this is my, my research agenda. I think we have to be more careful about this uh, transmission channel and conclusion. 
the results were highlight a still desired effect. Né? The real exchange rate has a positive impact on the economic growth of the development country. I think this is a uh, uh, still desired effect because this th there is a many papers and work show this, but uh, we don't have uh, uh, grande número de artigos. Uh, a lot of papers uh, specify the transmission channel and do the, the, the empirical tests. The influence of the real exchange rate on growth manifest in diverse and complex ways. Uh, it's evident there is much work to be done. And, and uh, of course, in line of this result, we can conclude that the central bank has the potential to contribute significant, significantly to economic growth by uh, ensuring a stable and competitive exchange rate in, uh, in the long run. So thank you uh, again. And uh, if you have a question, please, uh, after the presentation, send me. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, f first, thank you for the invitation to be here in this workshop, particularly to, to Nelson and Thiago. I will, my, my presentation will be partially based in, uh, in a paper that I wrote with two PhD students under my supervision, that is Julia Leal and Matheus Ferreira, that uh, they are doing the, the master supervised by Camille Feijó and currently in PG, they are under my supervision. <laughs> so heritage from, from Carmen then. And uh, this pa uh, the, the paper will be published in the next uh, issue of the review of case and uh, economics. Well, uh, the, 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 the title is Financial Subordination of Peripheral Emergent Economies, a Case and Structuralist Approach. Well, uh, we depart from the, the concept of uh, financial subordination, that's a bit in, in fashion, that uh, we, we find in the literature, the, the different and similar concepts, subordinate financialization, uh, subordinated financial integration, or simply financial subordination, that are similar concepts related to the subordinated way in which peripheral emergent economies are integrated internationally. Given the pro-cyclical and stable nature of capital flows, which generates macroeconomic instability in the periphery and reduce its policy space for domestic purpose. Uh, I understand that this is uh, promising concepts to, to understand the, the, the insertion of these economies in the international financial integration, but it, it still needs a more, a more precise and, uh, uh, analytical analysis. That's uh, I intend to provide some contribution. Well, uh, and uh, actually, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the contribution, uh, I have done a lot of work with, with Barbara Fritz that is here and Daniela Prats that uh, we develop a case and structuralist approach that takes into account both the monetary asymmetry and the financial asymmetry, um, it, it mainly for the implications to the, 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 the policy space of the, the, the peripheral emergent economies. And specifically in, the, in the, the, the paper that I, I mentioned, we try to show that peripheral emergent economies have different degrees 
of international financial subordination, which depends on two factors. The first is the manner of their international financial integration, and second is the type of productive structure that is if they are more or less complex productively. In particular, the idea is to show that there is an interaction, a connection between productive asymmetry and financial asymmetry in, in which each one reinforces the, the other. Well, uh, as for uh, monetary asymmetry, uh, <coughs> as the, we have a show in, in other works, is the idea is that uh, different currencies are positioned in the currency hierarchy with different liquidity premiums, so that the degree of liquidity of the currencies determines that their position in the hierarchy and consequently their ability to perform the functions of the currency in the international level in a very simple way, means of payment, unit of account, and store of value. So this figure uh, that is this monetary parameter that, that, that show the, the, the currency hierarchy, that the, the currencies are positioned hierarchically according to the, their degree of liquidity. The, so uh, uh, we are particularly concerned in the floor that, that, that most literature is, is, is focused on the uh, uh, privilege, exorbitant privilege to be uh, the top uh, currency or in the case of China, how to, to be an uh, international currency and our Concern is about uh, how are the constraints related to the to, to be a country that issue a peripheral currency, and uh, and uh, and the idea is very very simple way that uh, you have to to the peripheral economy have to compensate the lower uh, degree of liquidity, providing a higher interest differential in order to attract uh, investment. Well, and there is also the financial asymmetry that, uh, that is related to the asymmetric international financial integration of peripheral emergent economy during the financial globalization, subject to the stabilities of the international liquidity cycle determined mainly by external factors. Uh, in consequence of these both asymmetries, monetary and financial asymmetry, Peripheral economies have, uh, have to increase the interest rates to compensate low liquidity premium of their currencies, to borrow in key currencies, so it is very no the, the problem of the original scene, and in other work that uh, Barbara Fitz will present here in the workshop, we, we work with another phenomenon that uh, is original scene redux, and Third, the greater volatility in exchange rate compared to advanced economies. Well, it's just uh, this figure is just to, to, to show that uh, the, the, the red uh, is the int policy interest rates of the, a group of emergent economies, and the, and the, the black is uh, of advanced economy. We can, we can see this this huge difference between the, the 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 interest rates of these groups of countries. Well, <coughs> let me see what happened here. Got it. Um, okay. Well, uh, there was uh, as I, as I mentioned, uh, this is a Keynesian uh, Keynesian and, and structuralist approach particularly the idea of the, the Latin, Ameri uh, Lat uh, Latin American institutionalist approach related to, to financial integration is, is um, in a very resumed way, is the idea that there is not only the, the productive asymmetry between center and periphery, that is very low uh, in terms of the produ productivity that results 
in the tendency toward deterioration of terms of trade, that is the seminal work of, of Prebish. But uh, besides the productive asymmetry, we have also a uh, financial asymmetry uh, that reinforce the economic disparity between center and periphery as engender macroeconomic instability and reduce policy space for domestic purpose. So in a very simple way, the idea is that uh, th this, there is uh, 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 this disparity between center periphery uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, productivity, but there is also uh, a, a financial asymmetry that increase the gaps, the gap between the, the center and periphery for purely financial uh, reasons. Particularly, uh, José Ocampo, in, in his work, that showed that uh, the, this idea that uh, the, the, the financial asymmetry produce a macroeconomic asymmetry uh, that reduce the policy space of the, 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 the peripheral uh, economies. Uh, in, in Ocampo words, central economies are business cycle makers, peripheral economy economies are business cycle takers. That is, the center has more policy autonomy and is policy maker, and while periphery has less policy autonomy is essentially policy taking. Well, uh, it is very known as uh, the, the, the concept of stru structural uh, heterogeneity of uh, Nibel Pinto in, in 1970. That uh, this is very simple way. The, the, the idea that you have a modern and high productivity sectors that absorb a small proportion of workers in the periphery, while the rest of the economy, future by low productivity sector, absorb a large proportion of works. Uh, particularly, this the, the structural heterogeneity is a characteristic of Latin American economies, specializing in the production of commodities while East Asian economies have a much more diversified productive structure with a higher level of productivity and sophistication. And there is uh, uh, also an uh, interesting work of uh, Akius uh, <coughs> that uh, he showed what he called uh, commodity financial nexus. That is an interesting idea that it showed that, that the commodity and the financial cycles in economies specialized in the production of commodities tend to move together and reinforce each other because of a common set of global macroeconomic factors influence both capital flows and commodity prices in the same direction. So uh, you have uh, during the periods of uh, the booms of uh, the in the international price, uh, commodity prices stimulate capital inflows to, to peripheral economies, whereas increased capital inflows tend to rise commodity demand, commodity demand and prices. During the periods of bust of, of the in, the in the commodity price, you have a vicious, vicious cycle in the other direction in, in which falling commodity prices lead to capital outflows in the event of a, a global crisis, and which in turn produce recessionary adjustment of aggregate demand in such uh, economies. Um. <coughs> Well, uh, now uh, I will show some, some, some figure of, uh, of the Economic com Complexity Index. Uh, I divided on the left uh, uh, some Latin American economies, on the, on the right some more dynamic is Asian economies. So we can see uh, using this, this index that uh, are, are a clear pattern that is in the case of Latin America, there is uh, some stagnation. This data is from 1994 until 2020. That, that's in most cases of the, the Latin America economy is stagnated, reduced in the case of the Venezuela, and increased a bit in the case of the, the Mexico. But uh, on the other hand, there is a clear pattern 
in the case of the, 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 the is an economist that is uh, gradual and sustainable growth of the, the, the index of compl economic com complexity in case of China, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. Well, uh, in terms of the current accounts, balance of payments, uh, Eliane used this figure as well, but uh, in, the, in this case, we, we divide it. We put together the, the lat some Latin American economies on the, on the left and Asian economies on the right. And uh, for, uh, we can see in the case of the, 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 the Latin American, there is uh, a huge volatility in terms of the, the, the current account, but uh, we can see some pattern that is very related to the increase of the, 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 the some commodity boom and, and decline of the, 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 the commodity boom. In the case of uh, Latin America, we can see this in the, the 80s into the 2000, and the, the, then the, the reduction and some recent uh, increase. Uh, on the other hand, in case of the, the, the Asian economies, we, we have uh, uh, the, in all the countries an uh, increase in the current account balance of payments during the, the, the same period that uh, for, for, for the, these economies. <coughs> well, as for the foreign exchange reserves over GDP, uh, uh, again, uh, in this case, uh, join a group of uh, Latin American economies is, is an economy. We also, we can see a, a very uh, different pattern. Uh, the, uh, for, uh, for, uh, I could say for, for most countries, even Latin America, there is an increase in this, in this ratio. Uh, but uh, there is a much sharper uh, increase in, in case of the, the Asian economies, as we can see, the, the, the Malaysia, South Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, and, and China. That is, uh, is, is uh, here. The, the, uh, this, the, the Latin America are, the, uh, are this line here, the Latin America. So there is an increase, but much, much higher in case of the, the Asian economies. <coughs> and in this case, it's, it's over GDP, it's not the, 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 the amounts. And, uh, and as, as for uh, the, the exports, composition of the exports, we select here uh, the export of Argentina and Brazil and uh, uh, China and, and South Korea. Uh, uh, we can see clearly the, the, the specialization of, uh, of uh, in commodities, agriculture uh, commodities in case of Argentina and even in case of Brazil, that is the, uh, the main products are iron, crude, petroleum, sorbian, and corn. That is only, uh, only a small part of manufacturing that is here in the case of Argentina and here in the case of Brazil, that's uh, in, the, in the case of the automobile industry uh, is, is most uh, the, the, the trade uh, between the, the, two, the, two, the two economies. But it's very, very specialized uh, economies in the commodity exporters. That is when we, we, we compare to, to, to China and South, Co South Korea, we have a much more diversified uh, composition of exports with, uh, if, with uh, the participation of uh, manufacturing goods, elet ele electrical ma machinery, uh, machinery in general, furniture, uh, cars, integrated circuits, and, and, and so on. So there is, there is a clear predominance of the manufacturing goods in, the, in this case. Well, now I, uh, I will focus <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the financial, international financial integration of these, these, these economies. I took the, the figure from the 
Milese Ferretti database that is the, the stock of capital flows over GDP of, uh, of, uh, different, uh, of different countries. Uh, divided here, uh, again, Latin America. In this case, are three countries of Latin America, that is uh, Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. In the case of Asia, on the right is China, uh, South Korea, and Malaysia. And uh, as for, as for uh, external li liability, the first point that I would like to point out is the fact that we can see here that is 160% and here is 60%. So it is much, much higher level of uh, external liabilities in the case of Latin America compared to, to, to Asian uh, economies. It's the, it's the first. And in the case of the, the Latin America, there is a clear predominance of other investment that is this, this yellow bar. And the uh, second, the, the FD, uh, foreign direct investment. I, while in the case of Asia, it's very diversified modalities of capital flows. But uh, we can see in orange the clear uh, predominance predominance of FDI that is, we know that is a more stable capital flow. And, uh, and now have a look in, in the external uh, assets of the, the same group of, of economies, Latin America on the left, uh, Asian economies on the right. Uh, we can see that uh, first there is, uh, uh, in terms of GDP, a higher uh, level of the ratio for the, the Asian uh, economies, mainly because of the accumulation of international reserves, that is this, this, this blue, and uh <coughs> compared to, 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 to Latin America, that it also increases. The, 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 the participation of reserves, as we have shown, but it is lesser in, uh, compared to, to, to Asian economies. Another trend that I would like to, to, to point out is the, the fact that is this yellow, the, the increase of the, uh, the, the foreign investment for uh, in, the considered here as external assets, that is, is the participation of, uh, of residents, uh, uh, corporations, domestic corporations that uh, is becoming uh, more internationalized from uh, China, Brazil, uh, Turkey, and, and other, uh, other economies. India, of course. Uh, but in, that, in this case, it's just remember that is in this case, it's just Brazil, Argentina, in Mexico, in, the, in here is uh, China, uh, South Korea, and Malaysia. Well, and now uh, the net financial assets. The net financial assets is the result of uh, the difference between external assets and, and external liabilities. Uh, uh, Again, Latin America on the, on the, on the left, Asian, uh, uh, the group of Asian economies on the right. The first point that I would like is that this green line, that is exactly the, 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 the net financial assets over GDP, that is, is negative, less than 20% in the case of Latin America economies, and in the case of the Asian economies, in the, the begin, beginning of the series that begin, be, begin, begin in, in 1995, it was negative and became positive, more reaching more than 15% of GDP. So this is the, the first point the, that is very important. This is, is, is the Latin American absorb capital, capital inflows much more than, than export capital flows. That is, they have much more dependence on, 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 on capital flows than the, the case of the Asia that be, became positive in terms of the net financial assets. 
Uh, and this means that uh, uh, it is important to, to, to stress that the main, the main uh, net financial assets, of course, is positive in terms. Positive is the, the, the foreign exchange reserves. That foreign exchange reserves is only uh, external assets. It's not li uh, external liability because it's only assets. That uh, this is there is a rule. The, the uh, increase that we have shown in the case of the, the Asian economies, there is some increase in the case of Latin America, but because of the 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 huge amount of the external liabilities of Latin America is very negative, much more than than in case of the Asian economies. And uh, uh, again, the, there is this clear difference that uh, in the case the predominance of other investment in case of Latin America and the, in the case of the, the Asian economies the predominance of FDI. So. Uh, mm, uh, I think that is the, the data is very clear to show the, the different sort of, uh, of uh, uh, insertion in the, in, the, in the international uh, financial integration of these two, two groups of the economies that uh, in the case of the, the Latin American economies in a much more subordinated way compared to, to the Asian economies. So, uh, just going for the conclusion, uh, the, the, the idea of this paper, there is a lot of li literature, some of them uh, even uh, uh, showed here in this, this workshop, that, uh, that is very interesting, but uh, uh, that show that uh, the, the abundance of capital flows determined by the in, uh, interest differential and other reasons. They uh, result in the currency appreciation trend because of the Dutch disease. Uh, Albert Botta uh, talk about a financial Dutch disease as well. That is very compatible with the, 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 the ideas developed by, by Bresser. That is not only the, the Dutch disease uh, caused by, by the commodities boom, but also Bresser considered the, the financial, financial flux as well. And, uh, and uh, that uh, results in the regression, huge regression, desindustrialization, reprimarization in the case of the, the productive structure. Well, our, our idea is that there is a road of two ways. It's not only that uh, the, 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 the financial asymmetry results in a productive uh, asymmetry of the, the, the countries specialized, specialized in, in the export of commodities, but also in the other way, that uh, is the, the commodity specialization, that is, the, uh, the productive asymmetry also cause a, a, a financial asymmetries. So the, the commodity uh, specialization result in the dependence on the capital inflows. That, uh, as I, I show, with the a huge accumulation of, of external liabilities. The remem remember that uh, in the case of the external assets, the main Modality is, is international reserve that is, has a very, 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 very low interest rate rates for this, this reason that the, there is a huge transference, financial transference from the, 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 the periphery to the center. In the, the case of the, the council as Latin American, that has this, this negative results and that, uh, uh, that for this reason there is a, a, a rich, rich higher level of the, the financial uh, subordination. So uh, I conclude that uh, productive and financial asymmetry are two sides of the same coin. The overlap of this asymmetry defines the, the financial subordination of the emergent peripheral economies, particularly as I I show the Latin American commodity exporting countries have an economy that is not very diversified and complex, use it to have a strong dependence on foreign capital, 
and a volatile current account balance, and they are very dependent of the commodity cycles. In turn, the emergent Asian e economies, the group of dynamics emergent Asian economies, are diversified as exporters of manufact manufacturing products with a high added value, which allows them to have a strong position in their balance of, of payments with a high level of current account surplus, less dependence on capital inflows, and high accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. So I conclude that we cannot see emergent economies as a similar group of countries. There are different patterns of international financial integration and financial subordination. Thank you. <laughs> well, good afternoon again for everybody. Uh, I will be much more, I think, fast and I have a <laughs> simple presentation, a simple, much more simple presentation than my colleagues um, because I didn't get to prepare a, a large presentation. But I, I intend to talk about one issue that is really relevant for new developmentalism. There is, Bresse told about uh, that in the morning. So also Luis Fernando and also Eliane told, also talked about that. There is the issue related to current account balance. Okay, so this is the, the main theme, theme of this table, this round table. And I, first I'd, I'd like to reinforce uh, uh, an argument that is, I think it's counterintuitive, and but Bresser presented in the morning that uh, some countries they choose to grow, f grow based on a strategy of current account deficits. Yes, uh, this idea is really not intuitive because normally what you think is that the uh, appreciation causes the cause the the deaths in current account. Okay, it's true. But first of all, okay, in the sequence, you must think that some countries choose to grow based on this strategy. And why? Uh, they grow, they choose this strategy basically because the elites of the lights or the elites of the country, they believe that the country, that the it's, it's do, does not have enough savings, internal savings, domestic savings, domestic savings, and that they don't have the ability or the capacity to increase their that sa those savings. And surely I know that some of our colleagues will criticize me 
for telling that because they said no in savings is not fundamental to determine investment because you can have credit it's true yes and in general you can in order to start this process of development you can first have a, a kind of spending that can comes from credit can comes from polit fiscal policy can come from public expenditure and then the economy starts to run and then it increases and then the savings grow and then conse consequently inv the investment sorry and then consequently they grow the, the savings and but uh, but anyway uh, even if you think that credit it can be created and, and then even investment can be financed by money okay but some money issues uh, it's not the, this, the, the 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 prevalence of the the thought about the I insufficient saving prevails and then the the governments um, supported by the elites decided to grow with this strategy of current account deficit or better to attract foreign savings that is exactly the same how do they that that uh, in in the past the governments used to attract foreign investment and then to attract to make some debts as Luis also showed it was um, and then the external debt increases and in general we had a crisis due to this external debt, the, the growing external debt. Our history, not only from Brazil, but from most of Latin American countries, is a history of external debt and crisis and, and current account deficits, and then trying to solve those problems. Yes. And, but in general, in the past, as I said, the governments used to be indebted to finance the, the growth. It's, uh, for example, we did a lot in deals in Brazil, in other Mexico, in Argentina. But after the debt renegotiation of the 90s, the government decided to adopt another strategy, at least in Latin America, to attract foreign savings. And this strategy was based on rising interest rates to attract this short-term capital in order to increase the inflow, the capital inflow, but it's a short-term capital, and then to try to solve balance pro, uh, of payment constraints. But why did this, in, this strategy cause the, this balance of payments deaths? Because it undervalued, uh, sorry, overvalued the exchange rate as we know, and then it causes a decrease in the trade balance. But mostly, it, it, uh, it, this, this effect of this overvalued exchange rate is much stronger on the manufacturing goods, not on the primary goods. So it results in our the industrialization, reprimarization of our economies. Uh, I want to show to you that to show you uh, that the this current account deficit is related to the share of manufacturing in exports. Uh, that in Latin America, at the same time that we increase the deficit in current account, we decrease the share of manufactured goods in the trade balancing it surely uh, the impacts over the, the manufacturing in general and it, the, the, these events are totally related so sometimes the the, the country gets to increase the trade or in, keep a sh um, um, trade balance based on commodities commodity booms and, and the primarization, but the manufacturing exports 
surface and they really decrease due to this effect. And I'd like to show it to you and to compare with Asia, or with what happened in Asia, okay? So I, I sorry that my graphics were not perfect because I we, we, you can saw me doing that here. And I'm trying if you can see something, but these are, those are Latin American countries, yes. So uh, we can, I can show to you what is those countries that they are in general, in general they are Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mex Colombia, Mexico, then I will show another countries for you. And this is the current account deaths of those countries from 1960, around 90, no, this 1980 to 2022. You can see, so uh, regardless of the country, what you can see is that most of the situations are deaths in current account. So we have five countries here. We have the period from 80 to 2022. And you can see a few situations that we observe sub surplus in current account. So it's a history of deaths in current account. Second group that I want to show to you is combined it between some South American countries. And since we have uh, Fiona here and you have the other, other colleague from, we don't have anyone from Turkey, but I also choose some countries that had some profile to see what happened, okay? So you have here Peru, South Africa, Turkey, United States that I put together with them, and Uruguay, yes, Uruguay. Oh, where is our colleague from Uruguay? Yes, there he is. So you can also see here the same traits, okay? With some, a few exceptions in the beginning of the period, but when the, the, the strategy of high interest rates really um, prevails, you can see that large, large, and uh, not only large, but a, a sequence of deaths in current accounts. Um, by the other hand, I made it the same exercise for Asian countries, okay? So I also structured two different graphics about the situation in Asia. In this first, in this, in this graph, you can see China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Japan, and Korea. Yes. Um, what you can realize for the same period? So until the middle of 90s the situation was the, the, the tendency was not clear some countries exhibit death in mm, current account other superavit but after the middle of the 90s they increase they really increase the superavit it must be, it, should, it must be a strategy yes can be maybe might be a strategy that they adopted and they start to register mostly of the time superavit uh, surplus, yes, superavit, okay. And it's, this period surely matches the, the, the largest growth of China's economy. So surely China can explain a part of this superavit because they are very integrated, these economies. Um, but it's not the only reason. When you see another group of Asian countries here, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, you can see uh, the same effect, yes. So until the middle, until the middle 90s, and we can see different, uh, uh, it's not a clear tendency, and then it starts to increase. So this this case of this green line that is um, Singapore is really remarkable because it's a huge superavit compared to others. So surely you have some countries in the world, that if there are some countries that are surplus, others have must, be the, must have deficit. So there is not condition to everybody have surplus together. But it's if you don't choose 
our strategy correctly to grow with generating um, current account surplus will also will always be in the other group that is the group of current account deaths so what's the consequence for manufacturing or for the manufacturing participation in exports okay so here we have the graphs for the same group of countries but now we are looking for the participation of manufacturing in total exports yes so uh, just a moment Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico. Okay. With the exception of Mexico, okay, in Mexico, as Eliana highlighted, is a specific case, no? Because it's, uh, it's a manufacturer export. In Mexico actually is growing, okay, more than other countries, but it's a maquila, you know, so you cannot look out just for manufacturing, but also for the composition and of the or the value added okay in this this exports is the best way to look for that but you can see other accounts at the same time that they increase the deaths in current account they decline the participation the share of manufacturing in exports okay uh, we can see the same for the other group of countries peru south africa turkey uh, with the exception of turkey actually because this this country here is Turkey this green one here yeah this this higher country here that is increasing their participation is Turkey so then you can ask why does uh, uh, okay how can I say that a less democratic or non democratic government survives in Korea in Turkey one of the reasons is because they are growing and they are expanding manufacturing exports. So uh, I'm not defending that the government logica logically, but I'm just trying to explain from an economic point of view, the behavior of the election and population there in Turkey. The third group is China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and Korea. You can see that for most of the count, not, not for most, but hey, for some, most of them, the manufacturing increased, the participation of manufacturing exported, or increased, or at least keep it at, kept, or kept at the same level. The, the participation for some countries is unbelievable because it's around 100%, so they don't export manufactured goods. And they have also super everything in, in current account so see this is why i'm telling that those issues and are related okay the other group for of asian countries there are malaysia philippines singapore thailand vietnam is the same behavior with the difference that they are increasing largely increasing okay during the time and and it's it's uh, for me it's one of the key for to explain the the, the success of the, the growth strategy of these countries is the share of manufacturing in total exports is the, in the, and the growth of this participation. So Brazil did the opposite. Yes, we had 6% of manufacturing exports in the 80s, in the beginning of 90s. So, uh, yes, in the beginning of 90s, and then we have 30%. And the opposite is, is the share of primary manufacturing, as everybody knows. Okay, the last data that I want to show to you is the real exchange rate of those counts. Okay, so I, I one of possible is one interesting variable to examine also the interest, interest rate. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, put on the graphs, but here we have the, the the real interest, the real exchange rate for those countries. First, for Latin America, you can see that in the beginning of the period, the exchange rate was larger for those countries. And then when they decide to adopt this strategy of um, growth with external, based on external savings, the exchange rate started to appreciate and it, vary a lot so okay the volatility is too large and there is also an appreciation in the uh, after the 2010 
okay, in most of the countries, but it, this appreciation also comes from the 90s and, and so with the exception of this country, there is Mexico, yes, the other countries presented a, a val uh, valuation of the exchange rate, okay, you can do this, can see the same for those group of countries with, okay, the exception of Uruguay, okay, is performing well, the exchange rate, congratulations for, for you <laughs> and your country, but uh, the exchange rate, the anyway, is much small, uh, lower than in the previous periods, not in Uruguay, but in other countries here in the table, and we can see what happened in Asia. Yes, I know that the, the, the scale of the graph is different because you have China there with a very huge, large uh, exchange rate, but the other, but other countries, you can see, with the exception of Japan, yes, that is growing less, the other countries are increasing their exchange rate in the last, in the recent, more recent periods, okay? Or at least they kept, it around a hundred.
Thank you for this interesting table. First to Nelson, if I take your numbers from the second part of the presentation, you show a quite interesting picture of strong correlation of current account surplus with high manufacturer exports and, strong and high commodity export share with um, with current account deficits, which I find an interesting finding. I think sure it would be worth to go more more along this route to explain that. And there are several hypotheses around it. For example, the volati volatility issue, Danilo raised the third world law. But what is your hypothesis? Behind? You quickly mentioned the exchange rate, but I did think it's not so, such a clear link from the beginning. Okay, but I think it's quite interesting, the finding, and worth to go for it. Second to Luis, I find the connection between uh, the productive asymmetric integration and the financial asymmetric integration interesting, but isn't that correlation or the, the conjunction and interdependence of the two variables dependent on a certain degree of both um, resource richness of countries so that they can export commodities and at the same time uh, financial a certain degree of international financial integration. So isn't that a case which is a bit more specific for a certain type of countries, certainly Brazil and some others, but not the general case? So, uh, I, I will try to combine the answer for the two questions. Uh, what is the link? In my head, it is the, my presentation is about the, the, the second stage of this, this agenda. Because Professor Bresser show in the empirical literature uh, show for us, you have uh, strong evidence the real exchange rate, the value competitive real exchange rate can uh, promote the growth. So, okay, this is the, the still, is it, still is it fact. My question is, what kind of growth? What kind of growth? Yeah, what, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what kind of growth? Uh, which one, the, the losers and the, the gain, uh, the, uh, the winners and the losers, uh, uh, which is the, the sector's uh, growth and which is the sector's decrease. So this is the link with the, the mechanism channels of transmission, the real exchange rate and uh, structural change. So this is my, my question. Uh, I, I think you highlight this, this channel. So, tentando fazer esse link try to to link this this question but this is uh, a uh, start agenda yes yes Yes. Yeah, I, I think I, I we have a second effect. Uh, in my concern is about the income distribution, in inflation, so this is different effects in the, uh, yeah, it's more complex, this direct. But this is the second stage. I agree the this sentence, the real exchange rate, competitive real exchange rate can promote the, the growth in developed countries. Okay. Yes, in my equation, I, I, I specify this. The investment function is a function of the profit rate. But we have a second effect, this is the uh, uh, cost uh, cost of the uh, das importações, é. Uh, 
important cost because uh, we have a, a heterogeneous economy. A lot of a lot of sectors need to buy ins uh, insumes, inputs. Uh, yeah. Inputs uh, of the other countries. So uh, for Brazil, when you devaluation, you have uh, second effects in these sectors. So uh, growth must grow. No, is not coordinated. Uh, some some winners, some losers uh, in manufacturing sectors. In my presentation, I I think I tried to do uh, the research agenda and I put uh, the real exchange rate in the multi multi sector. Model Araújo Lima in 2007, and uh, I try I will uh, I try to to show this real exchange rate can be combined with progress technological in that model. I show mathematical. This is uh, I have uh, strong arguments that the real exchange rate can change the the external constraints in that model. But in empirical terms, I don't test this mo that model. I test the other, uh, and just uh, uh, we have a, a paper on a review. We try to do uh, for manufacturing sectors in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this is not the same model. Yeah, just a correlation thing, but it's not honestly, it's not the, the same model. questions uh, Fernando and Barbara yes well Fernando is um, the more polemical let's say that okay question because and um, if the exchange rate ca obviously has distributional effects okay depends on as you said we are discussing the lunch depends on the pass through depends on the which price will be affected depends on what happened with wages, but in general, so there is in the short term there is a distributional with negative effect, but in the long term, the effect is positive. Okay, even in short term, I can discuss with you if it's it's, it's a real really large effect depends on the pass through, but anyway, as we can see by the by looking for reality, okay, that governments they don't like to devaluate the exchange rate, yes, in general. So, so one of other politician that pay, thinks about that, but in general, the governments don't don't like too much. And but you said, how can you can you prevail prevail or how can you prevent from those effects? How can you deal with this? Uh, I. Well, Thinking as a policymaker, okay, when you first you 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 cannot leave the exchange rates to be more overvalued. This is the point, okay. You don't need to have a extremely depreciated or underappreciated exchange rate. You can, you must avoid the appreciation. This is the point, okay. But to avoid appreciation, you must reach this competitive level, okay. And so sometimes when you are, the problem is that when the currency is too appreciated, you have to depreciate, not you, but it, it has to be depreciated to reach those, this competitive level. And there is a cost on this period. Yes, this is the problem. Yes, the cost among, between this period, okay, in this period. Um, if I were a policy, a policy maker, I, during this period, I would reduce the import tariffs, the imports tariffs, okay? But then reduce and then return to the original level gradually if we have to do this kind of devaluation, okay? Uh, but in, but if you, you, if you have, if you reach this level, you don't have a large problem with this. So you can, you can work also with a kind of fiscal policy, fiscal, but it's not easy to, 
to tax some specific groups in the short term. So I think the most fast instrument uh, tool that you have to, to deal with this question is the import tariffs, okay, in order to compensate, to make this arrangement. Then you you stop with this, uh, when you reach that, that, le that level, you stop with this strategy and then you leave things go together with industrial policy, sure, okay. Exchange rate is not a suffic uh, sufficient condition. It's a necessary condition. So you have to also deal with industrial policy, science, technology, all the, okay, the other policies, okay, to reach the development. And when you are worried about in exchange rate, you are, we are not thinking on primary or primary goods or commodities. So commodities, are, uh, most, uh, there are lots of people that say, so when you evaluate the commodities, we will, be, uh, we will receive the benefits of the devaluation. Okay, but it's they will receive or you can tax them. Yes, it's one possibility. In this case, yes, but it's not politically easy, but you can tax that. But uh, we, what we are I'm worried about is the manufacturing. I think I'm answering Barbara's question also, yes. Uh, the exchange rate affects much more um, decis decisively, let's say, that the manufacturing in our countries because the profit rate of manufacturing in our countries is sm is smaller, is lower than in developing countries, yes. So when you appreciate the exchange rate, it affects much more manufacturing than commodities. This is the problem, okay? So you, if you appreciate the commodities continues to present a good trade result, okay, a satisfactory trade, uh, balanced trade, but not manufacturing, okay? When you decide to grow with external savings, so you, you know that the consequence is the appreciation of the exchange rate, and this appreciation will affect more the manufacturing than the commodity sector, because the commodity sector has a larger profit rate, and then he can support, they can f uh, face this exchange rate valuation much in a better situation than manufacturing. I hope it. I suppose it is your question. Yes. Okay. Um, I will make only uh, two comments. One um, to the question from Francisco Eduardo that he asked about the channels through which the uh, undervaluated exchange rate can affect the economic growth. Uh, in 2005, someone uh, made me this question, and I started to. to I tried to uh, look for um, empirical and theoretical papers related to this discussion. And at that time, uh, there was a paper from Professor Bresser and Paulo Gala that emphasized uh, the effects of uh, undervaluated exchange rate to investment and uh, to technological progress as uh, it can stimulate the production of more sophisticated goods. Also, there was the paper that you mentioned uh, from Danny Hodrick that uh, he talked about uh, um, market failures and um, contract failures. The idea that he presented was that uh, um, the best uh, the, be the best option was industrial policy, but uh, it was not uh, friendly to market, so uh, the undervaluated exchange rate was a second best policy that was more friendly to markets. And also, um, at that time, uh, we had some theoretical discussion about the effect of uh, undervaluated exchange rate to income elasticities of exports. I think. Fabrizio wrote about it, and uh, recently, I think the the most important paper that proved this idea was made by Nelson, Thiago, and me, that we tried to connect um, a real exchange rate and structural change, and uh, we did it by 
uh, trying to investigate the effect of exchange rate in income elasticities of export, and we create a very interesting database, and we analyzed very, um, I think, uh, very deep this question, and uh, it's a good reference. But we also have um, some papers that um, investigate the relationship uh, between uh, real exchange rate and productivity. So I think it's another channel through which the exchange rate can affect economic growth. So there was the idea from Hodrick, productivity, investment, technological progress, elasticities, and uh, I think it's uh, the, the, main, the main channels that I know. And uh, uh, for the question, uh, Fernando, question, only a small comment that uh, the problem with the, uh, the undervaluated exchange rate to income distribution, maybe it's a, uh, it's a <laughs> very important debate here in Brazil uh, from new developmentalism and social developmentalism. And the idea that uh, new developmentalism defend is that in the short run, in the short run, we have problem with income distribution because the uh, the valuation of the exchange rate can reduce real weights, but uh, in the long run, it can stimulate uh, um, the manufacturing sector, and uh, we can have the increase of the weights. So. It could be a problem in the short run, but the gains from the long, long run can uh, improve the situation. It's only this. Yes, please, please. Help one, me, one Professor. One thing. Uh, and. Uh, she, she, she referred to social development. This does not exist. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, but they, no, it does not exist. Okay. Uh, they but uh, no, they think they, think they exist, but that does not <laughs> exist. <laughs> but when I was discussing with them, that in the time that they thought it existed, uh, in 12, 13, 14, around this, I argued that, uh, as uh, Eliane argued, in the, short, in the short run the workers lose, but in the medium run they gain. Well, this makes sense. But uh, sometime later, I came to another uh, second idea, not another different. I had an idea. And what happens with the rentier? Well, that is the capitalists, the real capitalists today, are the rentier. Well, what happened today with the devaluation? Ask you what a devaluation. They lose in the same way that uh, uh, the workers lose uh, the, the acquisitive power of the dividends, interests, and uh, uh, real estate rents. Okay, that's, they are equal. But they lose also because they uh, have a wealth in, in the local currency. And this, lo this wealth in the local currency goes down. That's bad for them. For the workers, there is no bad, no, no problem because they have no wealth. And third, to have a devaluation the interest rate must go, go down, necessarily. If the interest goes down... Devaluation. If, if, devalu if devaluation goes... If there is a devaluation, the interest rate <coughs> must go down. Well, for the workers, this is wonderful. For the rentier, this is very war, very bad. My friends, the so-called, uh, no. So this is an argument for you. I'm not saying what would, would you, the social development, would be to do with your group of conclusions. A good point. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, I will join the, the Edgar and Barbara question. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, it's about uh, the external liabilities. Uh, as I try to show, that is, there is this difference between the two groups, the Latin American and Asian economies, and that is in terms of the, the, the amount of the, the external liability that is even over GDP that is much higher in case of Latin America, and also the mo modalities of capital flows that uh, each group attracts, that in the case of Latin American, other investment and foreign direct investment, and for Asian economies, is mostly FDI. And uh, what I, I try to show, we try to show in this paper, is that uh, the type of the productive structure of each, each country determines the kind of capital flow that each economy attracts. In the case of the, the, the commodity exporters, they, they, they uh, attract much more amounts because of one explanation is this, this idea that you have the, the commodity financial nexus, uh, that uh, you have uh, uh, together the, the commodity cycles with the financial cycles together. So the, the, the amount that uh, of, of capital in flows that uh, uh, attract is much higher than the necessity of the Asian economies that uh, attract mostly FDI. I, I know that FDI, there is a discussion about uh, uh, what's the meaning of FDI. You have uh, the, the also uh, intra firm laws inside the FDI. But, uh, it, even though it's a more it's a more stable sort of of uh, of uh, uh, capital flow, and uh, so there is uh, this uh, difference, uh, um, and uh, I think that uh, the 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 the. the the type of the, the, the productive structure, uh, it's important to, to, to understand uh, the, the insertion in the, in the international financial integration. There is something that uh, we, I have uh, had not focused, and we have not focused in the paper that is important, is that uh, uh, the, the insertion in the, in the international integration, uh, there is an important lag that is the, the, the uh, degree of financial liberalization. This is very important. The, it, 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 indeed, in this paper, we, we, don't, we don't consider that is uh, positive. In the, in the case of China, for instance, China has an interesting uh, <clears throat> data that uh, is, when you consider purely financial integration, the amount of, of capital flow that China attracts is very high. But uh, because of the FDI, is very high in, in the case of China. But at the same time, as China implements uh, capital controls, uh, the country can select select uh, the sort of capital that, uh, that the country attract. I am <clears throat> absolutely uh, sure that uh, if China uh, hadn't implemented capital control, the overvaluation of the, the currency of the economy would be very high and and, and probably China w uh, would have problems in terms of the, the, the strategy of development. Because imagine that uh, if China uh, uh, received portfolio capitals that uh, 
that uh, other, uh, as Latin America receive uh, very open, wh what would, would happen in terms of the, the, the exchange rates? It is, of course, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, again, as Nelson said, that, that it's not only exchange rate <laughs> about, but uh, it's, it's uh, uh, necessary, necessary, but enough condition, yeah, right? Not sufficient, uh, not sufficient uh, uh, condition. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to make a uh, coffee break of only 10 minutes, so we don't. Uh, 10 minutes, so. Mm. 10 minutes. The coffee's here, yes. Yeah. 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 Coffee there, and then we have oh, our keynote. Five minutes, yeah. coffee's here. Sabe que eu ia fazer o um comentário do seu trabalho? Sabe quando você apresenta aquele gráfico das reservas Sim. dos países?
to have someone also that uh, understands a lot about Africa. We had many presentations about Latin America, so uh, we we are very excited to to learn from you. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Greta, for the invitation. It's really an honor to address the important conference. Um, thank you also, uh, Nelson, Tiago, and the uh, rest of the organizers. Um, for me, it's always a pleasure uh, to come to Brazil um, to discuss these issues, uh, not only to see our old friends here and to talk food and the beauty of the country and so on, um, but more importantly, because I think Brazil is the country that probably has the most active research community um, in the world um, on these issues of structural change, reindustrialization, Okay. Uh, so, uh, apologies if those online couldn't hear the first part, but I'll just continue. Um, I think uh, Brazil has, has the most active research community in the world on these issues of uh, structural change, deindustrialization, industrial policy, and so on. Um, of course, we know that most uh, economists in, in Brazil don't work on these issues, but we don't agree with them. But th there's, a, there's a significant and, and a vibrant uh, research community um, in some other countries if you go to present on these you have to do, explain what is structural change why is deindustrialization a problem what, but here we can take the debates uh, further um, and I think it's uh, probably a couple of factors I mean partially the long historical tradition an intellectual and a policy tradition going back uh, 70 80 years to the early structuralists um, here in Brazil uh, more recently, uh, the contributions of people like uh, Professor Bresser um, in, in this tradition and uh, advancing it and taking in different di directions and uh, journals and conferences uh, such as this one. Um, and I guess maybe on, on the downside as well is, is uh, because of the real economic problems uh, facing a country like Brazil, right? Um, if there hasn't been deindustrialization and Dutch disease, probably there won't be such a vibrant uh, research community engaged with these, uh, these issues. It's like when you meet people from, uh, uh, economists from Argentina, most of them, they're working on uh, macroeconomic issues because uh, of, of their, their problems there. So, um, yeah, it, I think, uh, but d despite uh, those problems, um, it's really great to, to engage um, on these issues with uh, Brazilian economists and also looking at uh, some of the similarities between my own country, South Africa and Brazil, it's countries which are often uh, compared. Um, but I think uh, Brazil of course looks bad if you compare it to East Asia in terms of growth and structural change and even inequality and so on. But when you compare to South Africa, uh, Brazil looks good. <laughs> so anyway, we, maybe we'll come to some of those in, in the course of the, of the presentation. Um, yeah, so, so let me, uh, uh, this is what I would like to talk about uh, this afternoon. Um, I think I, I prepared uh, too much material, so um, I'm going to skip some of it because of, of, of time, uh, but I always prefer to be uh, over-prepared. I would like to first just start with the, the global context of uh, megatrends, some of the overall uh, picture in terms of uh, industrial production and deindustrialization, um, and talk a bit about the subsectoral dynamics. Um, and then, in terms of the, the structuralist approach and uh, structuralist uh, economic thinking, um, to look at some of the, the emerging directions and some of the new issues uh, in uh, structuralist uh, economic thought. And then to focus a bit on uh, industrial policy. Um, what are some of the current conditions for uh, industrial policy and for reindustrialization? What are some of the broad directions, some of the debates around the new generation of uh, industrial policies and so on? 
we'll see how much uh, we have uh, time, to, time for. So very briefly, um, in terms of the, the global context, I think some of the mega trends uh, that we're all familiar with, um, but that frame debates around industrialization and uh, industrial policy, uh, climate change, uh, technological change more broadly, um, but in particular the 4IR, and now the people are talking about the 5IR, um, pandemic and disease, of course we are emerging from COVID, uh, but it's not going to be the last. Uh, what are the lessons from that? What are the implications? Um, conflict, of course, it affects some parts of the world uh, in, in uh, uh, Europe and the Middle East more than in others, but I think it's also one of those dynamics which uh, is part of the mega, the mega trends. Um, focusing them more specifically in the global context in terms of uh, industrial production and uh, deindustrialization. Um, we see that uh, industrial production, um, even now, it remains fairly concentrated amongst a small group of nations. Um, in my talk tomorrow, I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So there has been breaking in to this group of uh, industrial producers over time, but mainly from a few East Asian uh, nations. And outside of that, uh, there's a limited breaking in to, to this core group um, of uh, industrial producers uh, internationally. Um, looking in terms of uh, global trends of industrialization and uh, deindustrialization, um, I think we can say that globally, in industrialization or, or manufacturing is pretty stagnant. Um, on the one hand, I think it's not the kind of sweeping deindustrialization that's sometimes portrayed. So sometimes critics of industrial policy would say, okay, manufacturing is a no hoper because globally it's just uh, going down the drain. I think that's not correct, um, but it's also not uh, growing, of course, uh, globally. So I would say it's, it's net stagnant globally. Some of this is a shifting around geographically of uh, manufacturing production. Um, so although we see deindustrialization in many countries, um, including increasingly uh, middle income and even some low income countries, some of that is a reallocation of uh, industrial production, um, predominantly to, to, to East Asia. Um, so that reflects this deindustrialization in many countries, but it's a kind of shifting around. Um, increasingly, we're seeing, of course, uh, premature deindustrialization, not only in upper middle income countries, but even in uh, low middle and some low income countries. Um, in some cases, what I've uh, called uh, pre industrial deindustrialization. So, in some um, African countries where manufacturing as a share of uh, GDP or of employment, barely hits even 5% and beginning to deindustrialize. <laughs> so this is what I call a pre-industrial deindustrialization. It's not like deindustrializing when you've hit uh, 20, 25, 30, 35 percent and then you level off, right? Uh, it's barely industrializing and then already uh, going down in some, in some low-income countries. Um, and I think that my last comment in terms of the global context, of course, is, is the rapid uh, technological change um, in manufacturing, uh, digitalization, even something like robotization. It's still uh, relatively uh, nascent. Uh, it's not a big share of uh, manufacturing production, but these are the emerging trends in terms of manufacturing. And of course, it's very uneven across countries in terms of the adoption of these uh, frontier technologies. Um, and I think will affect the global distribution of manufacturing. Because even in countries which are not advancing in terms of uh, frontier technologies, they are indirectly affected uh, by it. We might see some kind of reshoring of developing uh, countries' manufacturing to advanced economies um, and, and, and so on. So, of course, there's always been technological change, but the pace of it um, is accelerating um, in manufacturing. Uh, let me comment a, a bit about uh, the, the Brazil context uh, from that, that global context. Um, I'll, I'll be brief here because I'm sure everybody in this room is, uh, knows this much more than me, but uh, maybe also for those who are listening online. Um, I think uh, without going into detail, um, the, the major historical phases of uh, industrial development and, uh, and uh, policy in, in Brazil up until 1980, the extensive uh, state indicative um, planning in areas of uh, sectoral development, uh, trade protection, 
um, with industrial policy aimed mainly at uh, creating and strengthening uh, new industrial sectors, uh, moving away from primary commodities and, and so on. Uh, the, the 1980s and 90s, uh, structural adjustment, uh, uh, austerity, so-called stabilization, or uh, uh, initially uh, focused on trade liberalization, privatization, and then on uh, macroeconomic uh, stabilization. From the 2000s, the, the return and kind of adaptation or updating um, of uh, selective and uh, sector-specific industrial policies, but with a greater focus on uh, technology intensity and uh, technological um, upgrading. I've mentioned there some of the, the uh, major policies that I think uh, everyone is familiar with. Uh, I, I haven't, uh, this is the major historical phases. I haven't updated it to include uh, the more recent uh, years and, and even the new government of, of this year. It's, uh, uh, it's more generic. Um, commenting a bit about uh, deindustrialization um, in, in Brazil. Of course, there are many uh, papers written about this, uh, including by people uh, in this room. Um, so in, in one slide, um, I think I've uh, tried to uh, summarize my, my perception, uh, or my understanding of uh, deindustrialization uh, in, in, in Brazil. I would see it as a classic case of uh, premature deindustrialization, maybe one of the preeminent uh, cases of, uh, premat of premature deindustrialization internationally. It's longstanding, probably since about the early 1980s, similar actually to South Africa, where manufacturing peaked in around 1982, 83. Um, and uh, since then, uh, going through different phases in, in, in Brazil. And I think part of what makes it a classic case of, of premature deindustrialization it's not only that in terms of the levels of income per capita uh, that it kicked in at, but the fact that it's policy induced. Um, in terms of uh, macroeconomic policy, um, as we saw uh, from my characterization of the, of the, the major phases of uh, industrialization in Brazil, um, the focus on, on price uh, stabilization and, and, and low inflation uh, leading to, to uh, high interest rates, uh, overvaluation of the currency, and more broadly, a lack of coordination between macroeconomic policy and industrial policy. Um, so that whatever the merits of industrial policy in the different phases, being completely undermined by um, austere uh, macroeconomic policy, and then this being exacerbated by uh, trade liberalization, um, as well as the decline in uh, public investment. So I think, the, for me, I see these as the key kind of uh, policy components that uh, contributed to premature deindustrialization in, in Brazil. Um, and then the, the Dutch disease um, component of it, uh, which uh, Professor Bresser and others have uh, written extensively about. And I think the, the negative effects of this premature deindustrialization in Brazil are evident um, over a long period of time um, in terms of growth, in terms of productivity, technological progress, not only in manu manufacturing, but in the economy more broadly, um, as well as political economy effects in terms of class formation, uh, balance of power politically, and so on. So I think when we look at the effects of deindustrialization, it's not only about GDP, it's broader effects in terms of uh, the nature of the economy, the nature of the, of the society, and so on. Of course, it's not to reduce everything to that. A, like in any country, there are always uh, complex uh, factors and so on. Um, but I think it certainly has played a role. So, yeah, as I said, in, in one slide is a, it's my take on uh, deindustrialization um, in Brazil, but which people here know much more about. Um, this is a very, very simple uh, descriptive chart. I think one of the debates uh, in Brazil and, and other upper middle income countries is to say, is Brazil too rich to reindustrialize? Uh, ha have we gone beyond? Have we, have we moved on? beyond that. Um, so it's, uh, does it have a laser here? Yeah. So the, here there's no regression, it's just a, a very simple uh, scatter plot, which I was actually just doing uh, mostly for myself. <laughs> um, and then I thought it was interesting, so I thought to share it with you. Um, so each dot here is, the, the sample here is, is upper middle income countries. Uh, and it's including all upper middle income countries. I didn't. Uh, uh, select within them. Uh, it's just plotting uh, GDP per capita. No, it's not even in log and uh, manufacturing share of GDP. Uh, and, and here's Brazil. 
so you can see that uh, the positive uh, correlation here. Again, it's not a regression, it's not controlling for anything. Um, but within upper middle income countries, we're not seeing the inverted U. We're still seeing this uh, positive correlation. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me when I noticed this is that this is an empty quadrant. And first I checked my data, did I miss something or whatever, no. But this is just an empty quadrant. So there's no country, no upper middle income country, okay, which is richer than uh, Brazil and has less manufacturing than, than Brazil. So amongst the upper middle income countries, the only countries which are less industrialized than Brazil are those which are poorer, right? <laughs> which are poorer than Brazil. M more poor, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just from this very simple descriptives, uh, no regressions or whatever, it, it, it's, it's telling a, or it's a suggestive that if anything, Brazil is under-industrialized <laughs> for, for its income per capita, right? Um, oh, sorry. Um, Brazil is not like somewhere up there in the middle, right? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, if it was just somewhere up here for its level of income per capita, but we would expect maybe 5% more uh, manufacturing and GDP. So like I said, the only countries which are less industrialized are those which are poorer. Um, so, so just in a very simple sense, uh, I would say no, Brazil is not too rich <laughs> to, to, to industrialize. Okay, uh, let me take a step back from uh, talking about Brazil. Just very briefly, um, I'm not going to talk much about why manufacturing matters and so on. I think everybody here uh, probably were on the same page. But just uh, why does it still matter? So I think the characteristics of manufacturing, which led uh, Prebisch and uh, um, Hirschman and Caldor and so on to say the manufacturing matters as an engine of growth, those characteristics remain relevant, right? Um, later, I will come to tell why I think it needs a bit more nuance than that, but still, they, they, they remain uh, relevant. Um, so that's as an engine of growth. And then I think, secondly, I see manufacturing and industrialization as having a transformative role. So this is a part which goes beyond jobs and GDP, but it's about the fabric of a, of a society, the development trajectory um, that, a, that a, a country takes. Um, and even if you can reach potentially the same GDP per capita by a manufacturing and industrialization route versus another route, the, a country will have a different political economy and so on. So I think it matters in, in that uh, broader sense. Um, and then thirdly, that deindustrialization, and especially when it's premature, it undermines the prospects um, of other sectors or activities uh, driving growth. Um, so even when we take a kind of more nuanced approach, um, and I'll come back to this in the, in the course of the, of the lecture, that okay, it's not only about manufacturing, we need to be more nuanced and more complex and so on. But without going through that industrialization phase, uh, it's very difficult for, or I would say even not viable in general, for other sectors and activities like services to play that growth uh, pulling role. I think it relates with some, uh, Andres also talked about this in, in, in his uh, presentation in the morning. Um, without having gone through that process of industrialization and the technological change and so on that comes to, through that, it's very difficult to leapfrog into the kinds of services, for example, that could potentially be an alternative um, engine of growth. So broadly, I think uh, this is why manufacturing still matters. Um, and uh, yeah, this brings me well to uh, premature deindustrialization, which I wanted to talk about a bit. Um, so broadly, I would uh, define it as uh, deindustrialization at low levels of uh, income per capita, and I should have also said there, um, and share of manufacturing in growth and uh, in employment and GDP than would otherwise be expected relative to other countries um, internationally. So I think those thresholds, they change over time. Uh, and uh, even when we plot those uh, inverted U's over time, uh, they, they shift. Um, so it's not that uh, there's a, a magic threshold, uh, which is the same 30 years ago as it is today. 
but relative to other countries, uh, where deindustrialization kicks in at low levels of, of income per capita and shares of manufacturing and GDP and employment than would otherwise be expected uh, is premature. And in terms of its characteristics, it's typically policy-induced. It's not some kind of natural, incremental maturation of an economy. We're not talking about uh, you know, Norway or Japan or whatever. Um, it's something which is typically triggered by policy changes, uh, so-called liberalization, uh, uh, monetary, uh, fiscal trade liberalization, and so on. Um, and of course, even though we can say that deindustrialization in general is a problem, but when it's premature, it has particular problems uh, for growth and, and uh, development, because less of the benefits of industrialization uh, would have been captured by that stage. So it's very different uh, deindustrialization that kicking in at 5% uh, of GDP versus 30% uh, of GDP, where a country has already gone through that uh, transformative process. And as I said, um, when it's premature, it's less feasible, or maybe even not feasible at all, for a country to move to advanced activities in other sectors as potential engines of growth. So there's a lot of hype about services as an alternative engine of growth and so on. Um, yeah, if you're Finland, okay, and you've, got, and you've industrialized, and then you can move to advanced services. Um, if you're a, a low-income uh, African country, for example, you're not going to move to, to high-tech, high-productivity, uh, tradable uh, services um, as an alternative engine of, of growth. So this is part of the problem when uh, deindustrialization um, is, is premature. So it's more likely to have uh, negative effects on long-term growth. Um, yeah, so let me just uh, share a couple of uh, charts. Uh, this is from a, a, a paper by uh, Antonio Andrioni and myself. Um, of course, I, th I think people here are familiar with uh, these inverted U curves, which were developed uh, initially by, by, Rob, uh, by Bob Rothorn um, and uh, later advanced by uh, Gabriel Palmer as, as, as well as others. Um, so here we have just done some uh, simple regressions uh, of, of countries over time. The, the red curve is 2005. The, the blue dashed curve is, is 2015. It's just the, the standard uh, inverted U curve of, uh, of Rothorn and Palmer and so on. Um, and, and here, even over this 10-year uh, period, uh, we can see the shifting of the curve. It's something which uh, uh, Gabriel has, uh, has written a lot about in, in his paper of the four sources of industrialization. So the, the downward shifting of the, of the turning point, so countries are deindustrializing at a lower uh, uh, shares than previously, as well as the, the leftward shift of the turning point. So it's happening at lower levels of uh, GDP per capita. Um, so, so based on, on these in inverted U curves, uh, we've proposed the definition of, uh, or to formalize the definition of uh, premature deindustrialization, which is where, um, of course, the manufacturing share is, uh, of, of uh, GDP and, and employment is, is shrinking, so there's a deindustrialization. Um, but what makes it premature is that uh, it's, it's for countries that fall below the curve and to the left of the turning point, right? So, I mean, this is curve is based on a regression but we could plot uh, individual countries uh, in, re in relation to this. So we are arguing that uh, a country which is, is here, basically, is a premature deindustrializer, right? If it's based over here, it might be deindustrializing, but it's not premature, because it's already to the, to the right of the, of the turning point. Or if it's here, for example, it's deindustrializing and it's to the left of the turning point, but it's got more manufacturing than would be expected for its level of, of, of income per capita. So really we are looking at countries which are, are here, to the left of the turning point and below the curve and are deindustrializing uh, as the, the classification of uh, premature deindustrializers. Um, this is a bit uh, colorful and uh, messy chart. Um, is also just based on the same simple regressions. Uh, so it's your, your, your classic uh, inverted U uh, um, plotting uh, manufacturing shares of uh, employment and GDP against uh, income per capita and its, uh, its square term. 
So what we have plotted here in this uh, scatter plot um, is, is here on the x-axis the change in the manufacturing Chevron point. So it's simply the change. In this case, 2015 to 2005, uh, j just the change in uh, share of manufacturing employment. So is, it de is a country deindustrializing or not? Okay, so countries uh, to the right-hand side of, of this axis um, have a growing manufacturing share. Those over here have a, a shrinking manufacturing share. And on the y-axis is basically the residual from the regression, right? So the, the, it's your classic inverted uh, U type of uh, regression. So countries with a positive uh, residual have more manufacturing than would be econometrically expected for their level of uh, income per capita, and the ones uh, below here uh, have less manufacturing uh, than would be expected. Um, the, 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 the different colors is just uh, showing the different uh, regions of the world. So basically, countries which fall in this quadrant over here is what we've called a hidden speed in. So their manufacturing share is growing, and they have more manufacturing than would be predicted for their level of uh, income per capita, right? So here we see some uh, East Asian countries, uh, Cambodia, uh, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, and so on. Uh, these ones, they are under-industrialized, but they are industrializing uh, further. So here we see some, uh, some African countries, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Rwanda, and so on. These ones are more industrialized than what we would expect, but they are deindustrializing. And you'll see a lot of blue dots here, blue, the, it's uh, Europe and uh, North America. So here, you, for example, you, Europe, no? huh? yeah. uh, it's, it's just Europe in general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Europe and, and uh, the US and Canada, basically. So you, you'll see here like a country like uh, Germany. Um, it's, it's, it's still highly industrialized, even today. Yeah, but it's, uh, but it's falling, okay. And this is the worst place to be. <laughs> okay, uh, you'll see South Africa there, the, uh, the UK, Uruguay, Zimbabwe, and so on. They are under-industrialized and de-industrializing, right? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and the, and the ones within this that are uh, to the left of the turning point, uh, like the Zimbabwe, for example, will be premature uh, de-industrializers. Yeah. So then um, we, we go a bit further into the, the subsectoral uh, dynamics of uh, deindustrialization. Um, so here we did the, 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 the standard uh, inverted U type uh, regressions, but breaking down, uh, disaggregating manufacturing into high tech, uh, medium tech, and, and uh, low tech. Okay? So for low tech uh, manufacturing, which is the blue curve, we're seeing the classical inverted U, which uh, everybody is familiar with. In fact, even more humped. Uh, th than we would usually see, right? Um, for medium tech manufacturing, we see it leveling off, but we're not really seeing the downward slope, right? And for high tech manufacturing, it's basically a straight line. So we don't, and uh, this is a, based on the international regressions, cross country regressions. So for, for high tech manufacturing, there's no, there's no inverted U curve, right? The inverted U curve, is basically a picture of low-tech manufacturing and, and hens of manufacturing as a whole, but is not there for medium and high-tech uh, manufacturing. So to illustrate it further, uh, here I've, I've done the same curves with uh, just uh, specific industries uh, to illustrate to each of them. Um, so for, for clothing, for example, uh, as one of the classical uh, low-tech industries. Again, we see a, a very humped um, in, inverted U. The, the two lines is just uh, the two points in time. So the red is the earlier one, and the, the dashed black one is, is the later one. As an example from uh, medium tech, I've taken uh, rubber and plastics. Here we can see in the earlier period, it's uh, barely uh, flattening out, and the later period is starting to, to uh, dip down a bit. And then as an example of high tech, uh, for medical equipment, which is perhaps the most high tech of the high tech uh, sectors, we actually see it's, it's curving up. Yeah. It's not even a straight line, right? So at higher levels of income per capita, 
this sector is accounting for more and more of GDP. Is it uh, here GDP? Or, yeah, we've got the same charts, uh, employment and GDP, the pictures uh, is, is very similar. So when you're looking at high-tech manufacturing and, and a case like uh, medical equipment, um, for countries at high levels of, of income per capita, it's not just that you're not deindustrializing; it's increasing at an increasing uh, rate. Yeah. Um, so here, this is, is, is similar to the, the, the scatter plot which I, I, I showed before, but here it's specifically for high-tech manufacturing to see where different uh, countries are fitting in. But it's the same as previously. Like here is the change in the share of high-tech manufacturing and employment, and here's the residual from the regression. So basically, do you have more or less high-tech manufacturing in your GDP and employment than would be expected for your, your income per capita? So here we've got uh, a head and speeding in high-tech, and out here is, uh, is, is uh, Taiwan, right? It's growing, it's, it's got more than would be expected, and it's grown so fast, right? And we also see uh, Korea, uh, Finland, uh, and, and so on, Thailand, uh, China. So it's intuitive, right? <laughs> um, uh, even Ethiopia is on the border there. Uh, a low-income country, doesn't have a lot of high-tech manufacturing, but it's got more than would be expected for its income per capita, right? Ethiopia, Ethiopia. Ethiopia yeah. Um, yeah, here we'll see even similar. Uh, Germany, we'll see a lot of, uh, 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 you know, even East European countries, uh, which are integrated in the um, auto manufacturing uh, value chains and so on. And again, this is of course uh, the worst uh, place to be. Uh, you've got less and, and it's getting worse. <laughs> There's uh, South Africa, yeah. Um, so just uh, yeah, um, bringing together a couple of uh, observations for, from uh, th those charts in terms of premature deindustrialization and the, the subsectoral patterns is really to draw attention to the significant differences between low, medium, and high-tech uh, manufacturing. So rather than painting one brush of uh, deindustrialization, it's actually a low-tech manufacturing uh, story. Um, and even within each of those categories, there's a lot of variation. So here I just showed one example. I showed uh, clothing for low-tech and uh, chemicals and rubber for uh, medium-tech and so on. But if we look at all of the charts, from all of the different industries, even within each of those tech categories, you'll see a lot of uh, heterogeneity. Um, uh, yeah, so as a, as a stylized fact, we'd say that the more high tech um, a manufacturing activity is, the less is the decline with rising um, income uh, per capita. Um, and for very high tech activities, the shares actually rise uh, with income per capita. And this is even, for shares of manufacturing employment, even in the most uh, high-tech and capital-intensive capital and even robot-intensive activities like auto, um, which are not very employment-intensive, uh, right? But even for sectors li like that, you'll find the share of employment being positively associated with the increasing uh, income per capita. So it, I think it underscores the importance, um, both analytically um, and for policy, of analyzing the diverse dynamics of industrialization and deindustrialization at the subsectoral level. It's not enough just to say here manufacturing as a whole. You've got to drill down because the patterns are, are, are really so different. Um, yeah, also as, as I think a second observation is in terms of the changes um, over time. I think the, these are the last uh, charts I'll show on this. Um, I picked these sectors just to show how much uh, are changing over time. Uh, so again, the uh, the, the red uh, curve um, is the earlier period. The dashed curve is, is, the, is, is the later period. So, for example, this is for textile sector. Look how much has changed over time, right? So, uh, in the earlier period, we see the, the inverted U. In the later period, it's just a downward slope. There's no upward uh, sloping part. So from, uh, as you go from the lowest income to the highest income, there's no part of the income spectrum where it's, it's, it's growing with your income, right? It's good news for low-income countries, uh, but uh, not so much for, for middle-income countries. Um, another example, this is the auto sector. Um, so in the earlier period, it's a little bit upward sloping. In the later period, it's starting to, uh, to, to, to bend down a bit. So this is a, yeah, it's about the, 
the increasing prevalence of deindustrialization. Of course, they're not also matching uh, lack with lack because uh, what's in uh, each of these sectors is, is, is different over time. Um, and then I think lastly on this to, to draw attention to that diversity of, of uh, country experiences um, from those scatter plots, the ones which are ahead, uh, behind and so on, is really a, a, a mixed picture. Um, so it's important if you're looking at uh, industrialization in a country, not just to look at it in a static sense, okay? Manufacturing is 18% of GDP. It's just the beginning of the story. <laughs> is there, what is the trend? What are the subsector composition and so on? So in terms of policy implications of this, um, even high income countries that are deindustrializing can, can still be on the industrializing part uh, in, in terms of certain uh, high tech uh, subsectors of, of, of manufacturing. Nobody's expecting uh, Japan or uh, Germany to be necessarily growing its uh, clothing uh, employment overall. But there are parts of manufacturing that they can be growing uh, their, their shares of employment and, and uh, GDP in. So rather than giving up on manufacturing as a whole, it's about growing manufacturing in those uh, segments. Um, yeah, um, let me just uh, skip some of this uh, because of time. I think in terms of uh, yeah, pol policy implications, where, where you've got uh, that under-industrialization in countries, particularly in the high-tech uh, sectors, is definitely going to be a concern for growth. So we're in those scatter plots. I had like some of the, the poor countries of the world, which are down there in that worst uh, quadrant, is really not good news uh, for, for, for growth. Um, but it's about not no one size fits all response to deindustrialization. It's about looking at the dynamics and the composition and so on. Um, because we've been talking about the, the subsectoral patterns of, of, of deindustrialization, uh, just wanted to share, I think, some related findings uh, for, for Brazil. Uh, from uh, this paper by uh, Paulo Mosero, who used to be based as a, as a researcher in, in my center in, in, in Johannesburg um, and, and a co-author, uh, Guruto. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so th is, is in your, your, your journal, uh, Professor Bresa. Um, so th they are doing, uh, analyzing the deindustrialization for different uh, subsectors of uh, the Brazilian economy. They find that uh, the deindustrialization in, in Brazil is, is, is normal and is expected for some of the more labor intensive, or I think we could say the equivalent of the low tech sectors that I was uh, looking at, like apparel, furniture, and wood, and so on, but it's premature and undesirable for the more technology intensive uh, subsectors. Uh, for example, they look at machinery and equipment and so on, which those sectors started to deindustrialize at levels of income per capita lower than was, uh, th than was expected. Um, and some of the sub, uh, in, in knowledge and, and technology intensive uh, subsectors, like pharmaceuticals, electrical equipment, and so on, um, didn't follow a robust uh, uh, industrialization trajectory. So I thought it's, it's, it's an interesting paper because it, uh, it uh, echoes a similar kind of thinking around a subsectoral analysis uh, for, for the case of Brazil. So coming back uh, to take stock in, in terms of uh, the structure of, of where we are, I think I'll need to speed up a bit uh, because of time. Um, I'll now move to, to, uh, to, to look at, discuss a bit about the structuralist approach and I think some of the, the emerging uh, thinking. So I guess my, my rationale behind this um, is to look at uh, structuralism as a living tradition, right? Not as something which was contributed by founding fathers 50, 60, 70 uh, years ago. Um, obviously, I, probably we all here will agree about the, the immense contributions of this tradition to our understanding of development um, and of, uh, of countries' uh, pathways, um, both in terms of research and, and, and policy. And I will argue that the fundamentals of the tradition uh, remain relevant today around the importance of uh, industrialization and, and structural change. Um, and we can also see, of course, the, the institutional legacy of, of, of this tradition. Um, um, but of course, over, over these decades, there have been many developments, geopolitical, technological, climate, and so on. So it's about refreshing and updating uh, structuralism as a, as a, as a living uh, tradition. Um, I think even uh, we, we could see the, the new developmentalism school as, as part of that, right? It's not about uh, elevating what 
only what someone said 70 years ago, but, but uh, updating it uh, with the uh, uh, current conditions. Yeah. So, so these are just the, some of the things I wanted to touch on, but let me not uh, go through them. Let me just uh, dive straight in. Um, so the, the, uh, of course, uh, fundamental to, to the structuralist approach is the sectoral lens, right? Looking at the economy through the lens of sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, uh, services, and so on. Of course, there's much more than that, macro and balance of payments and so on. But the approach to the economy uh, looks through a, a sectoral lens, and in particular, looking at this uh, special role for the manufacturing sector. And the basis of, the, of, of that uh, sectoral lens is that within each sector, there are common denominators that have relevance for growth and development. So that even though you've got differences between different types of manufacturing activities, but there are some common denominators across all manufacturing activities um, that mean that a marginal job or a marginal unit of value added in manufacturing has got different implications for growth from a marginal job or unit of uh, uh, value added in uh, agricultural services. That's the, that's the starting point of, of it. Um, and I think that sectoral lens remains relevant, but sometimes maybe it becomes a little bit uh, uh, crude, what I would call maybe a, a sector fundamentalism. Um, so I think it's important to recognize the sector specificity of growth. Uh, manufacturing has, those, even today, has those common denominators. It has that special role to play. But we need to recognize not only sector specificity, but also activity uh, specificity. Um, so, so part of that, and I think uh, maybe it was uh, Andrea who, who talked about this in the morning, or, uh, or who was it? Well, no, it was you, uh, Danilo. Um, that uh, someone selling tomatoes on the street or, uh, f or a bank, they're both services activities. But they're completely different uh, things, right? Um, and so I think um, there's always been that heterogeneity about different activities within sectors. But if anything, that heterogeneity um, has, has grown over time. So sectors have uh, very different types of activities um, with, with uh, different scope for cumulative productivity increases. Of course, the scope for cumulative productivity increases is at the heart of a, a structuralist uh, approach. It's not just about productivity levels. It's about the scope for cumulative productivity increases. And it's uneven um, across sectors. And I think also over time, there's a, a blurring of the boundaries between sectors. So where does agriculture end and where does agro-processing as a manufacturing activity start? Sometimes even within a firm, it's not easy to, to draw that, right? Or if we look at the ICT sector, what part of ICT is services? What part of it is, uh, is, is manufacturing? Um, so there's this kind of fuzziness of, of uh, sectors, perhaps uh, more than previously. And I think linked to that, uh, what's been called the industrialization of freshness. Uh, so for example, even in some of the agricultural type of activities, um, if you go to uh, some of the more high-tech uh, agricultural activities, it's not like a farm, like you will read in a, ch a children's uh, uh, storybook, right? It's like an open-air factory. So in some, some parts of agriculture, yes, are more traditional, but some parts are increasingly mechanized. So some of the the characteristics of manufacturing around like economies of scale and so on, you can start to observe uh, some of those in, in, in certain segments. So my argument here is that the structuralist perspective on manufacturing as an engine of growth uh, remains relevant, but needs to be nuanced somehow. And in part of that is the subsectoral analysis. So here I link this theoretical approach with what I presented earlier in those charts. The, the huge variety within manufacturing, right? Uh, some of the in, uh, curves are going down, some are going up, and, 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 and so on. We could do the same for different uh, subsectors of services or, or different types of agriculture and, and, and so on. So we need that kind of nuance and not only sector specificity, but also um, activity uh, specificity. Um, a second uh, point which I'll talk about in terms of kind of updating the, the structuralist agenda as a, as a living tradition um, is the rise of global value chains, which of course is not new, but they're accounting for an increasing share um, of uh, global uh, trade. Um, some of the characteristics of uh, global value chains is, is, as we know, powerful lead firms uh, tend to control uh, market access um, and knowledge flows uh, within them. 
So on the one hand, uh, GVCs make it easier for countries to break into manufacturing. So in particular, uh, some, some low-income countries which are, are, are beginning to industrialize, um, it, it helps them to get a, a foothold in the easy sectors, in the easy segments of manufacturing, because you don't have to manufacture a whole car. You can manu manufacture a tire or a, a component of, of, of the engine or a seat or whatever. So it makes it easier to break into manufacturing production. But of course, the, the, the danger is that that foothold or that stepping stone, you, you, you end at that stepping stone and you don't uh, go to the next step and you don't, don't go to the, the, the next step. So the risk is, is for, for firms and for developing countries getting stuck in the low value added parts um, of, of the value chain. So how do I link this uh, opportunities and uh, risks of uh, uh, global value chains is bringing it back to the, the growth pooling potential of, of uh, manufacturing. Uh, so we know the, the traditional characteristics associated with uh, manufacturing in terms of economies of scale, cumulative productivity increases, uh, in increasing returns, and so on. Um, if there's an unstrategic integration into global value chains, it can weaken some of those traditional structuralist characteristics of manufacturing as the engine of growth of the, of, of the economy. So for example, where a, a, a firm or a, a, a developing country is, is integrated only and stuck on those low value added, least profitable parts of, of, a, of a global value chain. Um, the increasing returns uh, to scale that we traditionally associate with manufacturing, you don't get the benefits of those because where you have increasing returns, they're captured by the lead firm uh, in an advanced uh, economy. Um, even in terms of uh, domestic linkages. So again, this is one of the traditional characteristics that make us look at manufacturing as an engine of growth, right? The growth pulling, the, the forward and backward uh, linkages. But if the manufacturing is, is just uh, in a global value chain, so you integrate it in that GVC rather than with the domestic economy, then those backward linkages uh, are, 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 are weakened. Um, and, and even in terms of uh, technological progress, again, one of the classical characteristics of manufacturing as an engine of growth. But if all of the innovation and technological progress is happening in the lead firm in an advanced economy, you might be putting together a TV, <laughs> um, but that kind of driving element of manufacturing, again, is, is, is weakened. So where there's this kind of unstrategic integration into global value chains, um, of course, it has some benefits. It, uh, as I say, it can be a stepping stone. It generates some uh, foreign exchange, some employment, but it's like what we call thin industrialization or shallow industrialization is not going to drive structural change and transformation um, in an economy. So it's not to say that global value chains are bad or there shouldn't be integration, but it's about strategic integration, right? Um, uh, the importance of um, upgrading within uh, global value chains um, so that countries can move up uh, in that. I'm, not, I'm going to talk about this actually more tomorrow, so let me uh, jump some of it now. Um, the, the third uh, aspect uh, in terms of kind of uh, refreshing uh, structuralism as a living tradition, I think, is in terms of the micro-macro linkages. Uh, Professor Bresser talked about this uh, in, his, uh, in his lecture this morning, about uh, micro, macro, and so on. Um, I think in the early structuralist uh, contributions, 1950s and so on, had a strong uh, macro focus. Um, and of course, there, there, there've always been these uh, historical debates about the micro foundations of macro and the macro foundations of, of uh, micro. Um, some neoclassical economists uh, or criticize uh, Keynesian, post-Keynesian economics, or it, it doesn't have micro foundations. I mean, what they're usually saying is that it doesn't have uh, our kind of, uh, uh, or their kind of uh, <coughs> micro foundations. And again, if, if we look at a lot of the mainstream uh, microeconomics, which is fashionable today, it doesn't have uh, macro foundations as well. Um, but thinking about this micro-macro debate in relation to, 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 to structuralism, um, I think over time, Maybe let's say if we look at the, the last maybe half century of uh, structuralist thought and, and developments within that, um, I think there's probably a, a, a growing emphasis on complementing that early macro uh, 
focus with also a micro focus. So we see increasing kind of uh, firm, uh, firm level analysis and so on. It's not to say the macro doesn't matter. Macro is, is fundamental, especially at a policy level. But I'm talking in terms of maybe research agendas in here and so on. Having that iterative approach between uh, uh, micro and macro. So for example, looking at the firm level in terms of um, innovation, learning, capabilities, um, upgrading as part of the micro foundations of structural transformation and catching up. So if we look at structural transformation, it's not just, okay, less agriculture, more manufacturing. Let's look at uh, the, the, you know, the, the aggregates. The micro foundations of that are at the firm level, right? Being able to grow uh, manufacturing firms to upgrade and, and, and so on. So I think part of this, uh, if I can think of it as a, as a kind of research agenda for, for structuralist economists, is about thinking through how those kind of firm level changes, innovation and uh, upgrading and so on, which are largely incremental, how do these connect with the uh, macro uh, aggregates? Um, and I think part of this is, is that now in, in, in developing countries, there's much greater availability of firm level data than was the case uh, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, when it would largely be in advanced economies. So now increasingly we have uh, firm level data in um, developing countries, which can enable more analysis. Um, so here, I'm, I'm not trying to say that uh, micro is more important, or, uh, not, not at all, but to say that uh, I, I think part of it is, uh, is, is about looking at the, the, the kind of integration um, between these. Because even in terms of uh, researchers, often we find that these are, are quite disconnected communities. So there's people who are doing uh, macro modeling, people who are doing firm level innovation stuff, not much uh, uh, talking to, to, to each other. So I think for me it's about an, an integrated uh, structuralist uh, agenda. And I guess this brings me to the next point, which is around innovation and uh, technological change. Um, of course this is not new whatsoever. And it's, uh, uh, technological upgrading has always been fundamental in structuralist uh, economic thought. But I think there's a, a growing emphasis even now on the importance of, of, of this and of upgrading, again, as part of those kind of uh, micro foundations um, of, of structural change. So when we talk about uh, cumulative productivity increases, part of that is a, is a sectoral change in the economy, but part of it also is uh, technological change um, across sectors. And again, I think that this connects as well to those charts which I was showing earlier, those inverted U type of curves, right? And, and the huge differences between low, medium, and high tech. Again, it points to the importance of trying to upgrade to those higher tech uh, ac activities, even within de developing countries. Um, so it's, it's implicit, and it's always been there in the structuralist uh, approach, um, because I think we can, we can think about the two dimensions of structural change, the kind of the sectoral shift, and then the upgrading even within uh, different activities. So it's not just about more manufacturing, it's about also more quality, even uh, within manufacturing. Um, let me move on. Uh, yeah, of course, the, the issue of, uh, of climate change um, originally was not part of uh, structuralist uh, economic uh, thought 70 years ago or whatever. Um, but now uh, it, it's a fundamental problem uh, facing humanity. And the reality that we have to confront as uh, researchers uh, at a, as proponents of industrialization, right, um, is that industrialization in industry is one of the major contributors uh, to, to, to emissions. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't support her or we are no longer advancing industrial, but we can't, uh, we, we can't be silent about that. I think even maybe 10 years ago, within, let's say, researchers who are working on structural change and industrialization, industrial policy, there was less of a sense of urgency of looking at this. It's like, okay, some other people are, are environmental economists, kind of, uh, they're sitting over there and they're hand, uh, handling that, and we're working on manufacturing. I think it's not, it's not sustainable, um, either economically or even uh, politically and, and so on. So um, I think for, for researchers in the structuralist tradition, uh, like myself and like ourselves, it can no longer be seen as a, as a secondary issue. Um, for uh, developing countries, there's this uh, tension, on the one hand, the need to industrialize, on the other hand, the need to mitigate um, emissions. 
Um, some people will argue that an industrialization pathway is no longer even a viable option due to climate change. I don't agree with that. Um, because there is the potential for decarbonizing um, industrialization. Green industrialization, uh, green industrial policy. Um, it, but it, it brings different dynamics to the debates and the options around late industrialization, right? Uh, for developing countries, we couldn't call as, as late industrializers or even late, late industrializers, um, who are trying to industrialize today are facing different conditions from what uh, Europe and uh, the US and Japan, they didn't have to bother about this when they were industrializing. But now let's say it's a low income African country, they're trying to industrialize, at the same time are told, no, you have to de decarbonize at the same time, right? And yeah, maybe we'll make some soft loans or something, yeah. Um, but of course there are also windows of opportunity associated uh, with this. Um, so, uh, because of the fluidity that it's, it's not like traditional manufacturing where there are already countries with well-established comparative advantage and so not that you can't break in, but there's more fluidity in this because there's new products which have growing demand and even for traditional products, there's new production processes in terms of more sustainable production and so on. So this presents windows of opportunity for, uh, for developing countries to industrialize. But those windows of opportunity won't just remain uh, open. Uh, it's not that, okay, there's a specific day when it's, it's shut and you can't get in anymore. But for example, even within, um, uh, let's say, clothing production, it's one of the traditional stepping stones for developing countries to break into manufacturing, clothing and textile. Um, but now increasingly, if, for example, in European markets, uh, there will be these uh, uh, requirements in terms of uh, clean production and so on. So it's not just do you care about the environment or don't you care, um, but it's about literally market access. Um, and the slower that firms and, and economies are to adapt, the more difficult to get into those, uh, those windows of opportunity. Um, I think the, 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 the last issue I, I wanted to touch on in terms of kind of refreshing uh, structuralism as a, as a living tradition, it's a combination of issues here around gender, class, uh, social policy, and, and so on. Um, in the early structuralist tradition, gender was almost uh, not featuring um, at all, but it's now increasingly recognized uh, that women and men are differently affected um, in industrialization. And there's different industrialization pathways, light, heavy, export-oriented, domestic-oriented, which are going to affect uh, women and, and uh, men differently. So there's a growing uh, literature on this, I think, within uh, structuralist economics and industrial economics. The attention in terms of industrial policy, I think, is, is uneven across countries. Um, in, in, in terms of issues of class, of course, it's a long-standing debate in the literature, going back to debates with uh, dependency theory and between different uh, heterodox uh, traditions, uh, structuralist, Marxist, and so on. Too much to go into here. But I think uh, what I wanted to draw attention to is, is the role of industrialization um, in class formation. And I'm not only talking about the working class formation, but even uh, middle class, uh, bourgeoisie and so on. It's going to be a different class if it's a manufacturing based or financial uh, based, right? Um, and again, it's got implications in terms of uh, political economy, politics and, and uh, elections and so on. So it's about, uh, yeah, it's too much to go into here, but it's about uh, linking those. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, lastly, in relation to this, um, it's about kind of connecting industrial policy and social policy, which are often not connected, either in literature or policy. So we'll have uh, people here in this room who are working on industrial policy, and there are people somewhere else who are talking about poverty, right? Um, but I think now, both in, in research and in terms of uh, public policy, Yes, there can be different focuses, but they have to connect. So even industrial policy has to think about uh, distributional uh, effects, not only by gender, but by region. Um, even when we talk about uh, social policy, social grants uh, for the poor, what is the impact of that in terms of industrial production? How can we, how can we integrate those so that even when we're paying out social grants to assist the poor, it's not only about putting food in someone's stomach, but it's also about uh, creating demand 
uh, for industrial production and so on. Yeah, so, so this was basically what I was trying to highlight in terms of, I think, uh, some of the kind of emerging, not new, but uh, areas of focus within structuralist economics. Not everyone is going to work on all of these, but some of the things that we need to factor in to, to structuralism as a, as a living tradition. Um, I, I guess I'll need to, to, to wrap up uh, because of time, so I'm, just, I'm not going to cover uh, everything in, in, this, in this third part of the talk, but just uh, to give a little bit in terms of conditions and directions uh, for, for industrial policy. Um, yeah, so this is just uh, highlighting maybe some of the current conditions and some of the, the challenges for industrialization and industrial policy in developing countries. I won't have time to, to go into it in, in, in detail. Just touch on some of them. I think one of them, for example, is, is where to find a competitive niche. So traditionally, for, for developing countries trying to break into industrialization, um, would have maybe lower unit labor costs than more advanced economies, and be more technologically advanced than less advanced economies. Not necessarily that it's linear, but this is the basics of a, of a comparative advantage, right? And it's even less linear now than it was in the past, and partially because of what I would call the China squeeze. Um, that China would have uh, both, uh, even though it's got rising unit labor costs than what it had before, but still now lower unit labor costs than many other uh, middle income countries, as well as being one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. So it's almost got a kind of advanced country technology with the unit labor costs uh, that are lower. So it's a squeeze on maybe other middle income countries. Not that it squeezes us out completely, but it's a reality there also because of the size. Um, yeah, issues in terms of uh, productive capabilities, rapid technological change, combined with barriers to technology access, which are not new, but I think are stronger now than, than they were previously. Uh, the issues about breaking into value chains, as I've said, uh, the risk of getting stuck in the less uh, productive parts, barriers to accessing markets um, in, in developed countries due to tariffs and uh, non-tariff barriers. Um, in terms of debates around industrial policy, I think it's a mixed picture in terms of context. Um, on the one hand, there's a eroding of some of the industrial policy space due to WTO, TRIPS and so on, but sometimes people also overstate this. It's, oh no, we can't do industrial policy because of uh, WTO. No, there's still a lot <laughs> that you can do. Um, and on the flip side of that is the mainstreaming of, of industrial policy. So things which used to be a bit controversial to talk about now everyone is talking about industrial policy. Of course, we've got different interpretations of what that means, but it's more mainstream uh, than, than previously. So it's a mixed picture. Yeah, poor infrastructure, climate change, I've talked about a weak state capacity, some of the political economy factors. Um, I think it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's, a, it's a dialectic that industrialization contributes to class formation, but sometimes also where you have a, a, a social and political structure where you don't have coalitions of, of coalitions of interests that are vested in the success of industrialization. It's difficult to drive through sustained um, industrial uh, policy. You can have an election change uh, favoring financial capital or a commodity producer. Yeah, I, I don't need to tell Brazilians about this, but I think where there's a lack of um, powerful interests that are invested in industrialization project, it's, uh, it, it creates challenges. Uh, and of course, uh, unfavorable macroeconomic conditions, and especially for poor countries, um, competing fiscal demands and financing uh, industrial policy. I'll skip some of this because of time. We can come back to it. Um, I think some of the broad uh, directions for reindustrialization, uh, in, not only in Latin America, but other developing countries, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing focus on uh, innovation, building capabilities, uh, technological upgrading that I've talked about. Um, one of the lessons from COVID is the importance of uh, domestic manufacturing uh, capacity and capabilities. It's not something that you can build overnight. When you need masks uh, and you don't have factories which are capable of uh, producing masks, you can't do it uh, uh, in one night. Of course, COVID was extreme, but it's an example that drew attention to the importance of, of, of these capabilities. Uh, GVCs I've talked about and uh, windows of opportunity, 
um, I think still in, in uh, industrial policy in many countries, uh, there's an industrial policy and then maybe at the end something, okay, and uh, by the way, we should also have some green industrial policy. And, uh, it's like an afterthought, but actually needs to be integrated um, as, as core to, to industrial policy. Um, yeah. Let me just uh, go through some of this quickly because I want to talk about the last one and it's last but definitely not uh, least which is macro, macro, macro. <laughs> um, so you can have the best industrial policy on the world uh, written in paper, but if the macro conditions are wrong, forget about it. <laughs> and then the critics of industrial policy will say, oh, you see, we are putting all of these incentives, we're putting this money towards it, but still, industrial jobs are going down. So it's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, right? But you can do whatever, incentives and whatever. If the macro conditions are wrong, uh, you may as well just go home. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a historical lesson, but we, we see it even today in my own country and uh, elsewhere. So the, the fundamental importance of mac macroeconomic policy and the, the coordination um, between macro and uh, industrial policy. It looks like we haven't learned the lessons of all of these uh, decades because it's still not, n not there. And I think, again, it, it relates with what I mentioned a bit earlier about even in terms of political economy, having coalitions of interests that are vested and invested in the success of industrialization. It relates with this, because if you don't have those coalitions of interests, you're not going to have a macro policy, because the people who are influencing macro policy um, are the banks. I think it relates even with the, some of the presentations earlier on financialization and so on. Um, so even macro policy needs to be influenced by uh, the, the interests of, of, of industry. There's a lot of debate around uh, what sometimes called the new generation of industrial policies. And I think part of this is maybe a feeling in some quarters, uh, not among our circles, but maybe in some international organizations that, okay, industrial policy, no, that's like, uh, it's a bit old, we need to update, you know, we need uh, this new generation and so on. Yes, of course, industrial policy needs to be updated and, and uh, relevant and so on. But it's not about discarding the lessons of successful industrial policies. Um, what we see in, in, in Korea or China, how over a generation, people's lives were, were, were transformed. In the, in the 60s, these countries were poor, poorer than most of the African countries, even in Korea. And now, uh, look at it. <laughs> it's not just something on paper of uh, growth rates and so on. It's, it's transforming people's life opportunities. Um, so it's not about discarding all of that and, oh, no, we need this new generation. Th those lessons remain uh, relevant today. It's not one size fits all. It's about adapting them to, to the current period and uh, country context and so on. Of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity among uh, developing uh, countries. Um, so we need that country-specific approaches. It's not about blueprint. But, and where there are successes that show the possibilities. Of course, of course, we look at China. It's not only about China. Even amongst low-income countries like Ethiopia, it's not perfect. But it shows that even in this period, uh, low-income countries with a political will can industrialize. Uh, th th there are possibilities there. Um, so the, the so-called new generation of uh, industrial policies, I think it's both about the content, but also about how they are designed and implemented. So I think part of this is a growing emphasis on uh, horizontal and vertical coordination. So it's not that industrial policy is just a preserve of Department of uh, Trade and Industry, or whatever it's called in different countries. And they're the ones who must do, only do industrial policy. It's about coordinating. Um, I talked about macroeconomic policy, but even beyond that, it's about coordinating horizontally as well as vertically. So national, uh, state or regional, and even local. I think 20 years ago, we didn't see local government, for example, as playing a fundamental role in, in, in industrial policy. So I think uh, there's a growing emphasis on, on, on that, um, as well as a growing emphasis on kind of learning and co-creation of industrial policy uh, with the private sector information exchange, collaboration, uh, co-creation of industrial policies and so on, I think is in increasing focus. Um, but even with that learning process with the private sector, I think I'm, I'm one of those people which would still emphasize the importance of disciplining capital. <laughs> uh, 
um, of conditionalities and so on. It's not just, okay, let's all uh, hug and uh, uh, make industrial policy together. Yes, that's important, but there has to be that rent management and uh, discipline of capital and so on. Um, I think I'll just skip most of this because of time. Yeah, I'll jump all of if you would like to hear this, you can invite me for a, a webinar next year or a, a, a virtual presentation and I will, I will share more. Um, yeah, let me maybe leave it there. I'll just leave this on the screen. Um, is my last slide. I thought because there's a lot of young scholars who are attending this uh, conference uh, online and so on, I think uh, for me this is some of the important uh, research directions um, in, in, the, in the field. For me, it's, it's, a, it's a vibrant, it's a living field. Structural change, industrialization, industrial policy. Um, there's, there's decades of, of uh, research and policy and experiences to build on, but there's so much uh, to, to investigate. Uh, so for, for young scholars who are looking for PhD topics and so on, uh, there's, uh, there are so many exciting uh, things to work on. For me, this is just uh, yeah, this is some of the, it's not topics, but some of the broad areas that I think is, uh, have a lot of uh, research potential. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, I'll be talking more about the uh, middle income uh, trap. And uh, lastly, just in, uh, in ending off, uh, to say that um, uh, my, my sentence, South Africa, South African Research Chain Industrial Development, uh, will welcome any uh, opportunities for collaborating with the uh, Brazilian researchers. As I said at the beginning, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably the most vibrant uh, community uh, in the world who are working on these issues. So we'll welcome those kinds of links. Uh, we have some opportunities available for, for postdoctoral researchers and for uh, visiting professors and so on. Uh, I'd be happy to, to talk to anyone or, or by email. So let me leave it there and uh, thank you again. <laughs>
to, to have big investments, you have to have growth. Uh, because if you don't have growth, you don't have fine resource. The reason why the rich countries, especially the European countries, are so capable of, is because they are capable, <laughs> and, but also it's because they are rich. And so they have a lot of money, they have a lot of resources, because they have growth. I would like to, your comments to those points. Congratulations, Fiona, for your wonderful presentation. It was really fine. I enjoy it too much. And I have two comments but, uh, more related to the beginning of your presentation. So when you show the c curves, uh, the U inverted, and the specific cases for uh, heterogeneity, heterogeneity, okay? And my impression uh, is that uh, the the curve that is more inverted in the case of low, um, low, low tech. not low skill, low, low, low tech, low technology, uh -huh. because I'm thinking more job, uh, labor market. So, uh, it's related to China, yes, because it, when China first entered in that market, okay, of low technology, low tech. And then when you see, for example, for the auto industry that it nowadays is turning, mm -hmm. it's also because China in, entered on that market, but lately, not yes, not on the, at the same time that they ingressed at low technology. So I don't know if you studied that those those reasons and uh, okay, uh, what is behind and then. And a very interesting case for me was the Ethiopian case that you showed that. I don't know if you study or you can maybe, I don't know if it's closer, it's closer geographically, but I don't know if you study, okay? Because you said that it's uh, an industrialization, that it's high tech. I, I heard that it's low, I didn't know, but I suppose it before, the, before hearing for you that it was low tech. So you said that it's high tech. It's very interesting case, yes, to study and to to know a little about. If you know something, please. Uh, thank you for uh, your very interesting presentation. I'd like to hear you, you Fiona, uh, if you could provide some examples of uh, successful, recent, successful oh, industrial yes. policy experience out of East Asia, <laughs> okay? <laughs> to, just to, to, to provide some, some interesting recent experience. Uh, th th thanks very much for these uh, really pertinent uh, questions. Um, in terms of uh, Professor Bresser's, I think this was more some comments. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in terms of services, uh, for example, as you mentioned, uh, and the issue of uh, productivity sophistication, I think it's, again, it's, it's the same concept which I'm getting at with uh, combining sector specificity with activity specificity. So it's almost like two dimensions, right? Uh, that within any sector, there's also activity specificity in terms of technology intensity, export orientation, and so on. Um, and these two dimensions, sector specificity and activity specificity, they have a connection, right? And that's why we still say that manufacturing matters. But there's a, a heterogeneity within each of, each of them, right? We can see it within services, like from uh, Danilo's example. We can see it within manufacturing from uh, those different curves. Even within agriculture, a subsistence agriculture of someone who's just uh, trying to feed their family is very different from the, some of the high-tech uh, ag agriculture and so on. So it also implies, even in terms of uh, industrial policy, um, that even industrial policy needs to target uh, some of these uh, activities, not only about manufacturing. Manufacturing remains important, but it's not enough to only target uh, manufacturing. Uh, Professor Bresser's second uh, question in terms of or, or comment on uh, climate change. Um, so, I mean, some people, and of course from the global north, 
we'll even take it further to uh, talk about degrowth and so on. Degrowth doesn't make sense in a developing country context. Uh, we have children that don't have enough to eat. Can't talk about uh, degrowth, <laughs> right? Um, but it's about changing the, you know, the structure of growth, changing how things are produced and so on. So industrialization remains important, remains the central route to, to, to catching up, but it's about uh, you know, doing it in a sustainable way. And part of that, and I think related with what you were saying, is about access, access to finance and access to technology. So we know that uh, developing countries are not the ones which have caused <laughs> global warming, right? It is global warming is co caused over a long period by the advanced economies, but developing countries are, are feeling the brunt of it. They're the most highly affected by, uh, by, by, by climate change. Um, so access to finance needs to go beyond uh, just uh, some soft loans to, to net uh, transfers of, of resources. And similarly in terms of access to technology, because if there's not access to technology to produce in a cleaner way, it's like shutting developing countries out of those green industrialization uh, pathways. Uh, in terms of uh, your Nelson's comments, how much is China a, a part of, of that, I guess the, the shifting shape of the curves um, over time? So I, I think it is part of it. It's, I think it's not the whole story, which is in, um, but I, I agree that it's an, it's an important part. But even now some of the more low-tech activities China struggles to become uh, competitive in, right? <laughs> in relation to uh, Vietnam and uh, Bangladesh and so on. Um, so I think it's that increasingly uh, low and low middle income uh, and other even upper middle income countries are entering into some of those uh, uh, activities. Um, and some of those are, are starting to shrink in the advanced economies and that will bend down the, uh, the, the shape of the curve. Um, let me comment on, on Ethiopia in relation to both of your questions. Was I don't have a long list of uh, industrial points and so on to, uh, to go through, but let me uh, just make the example. So I think um, e Ethiopia has a, a lot of complications and going through a civil war and so on, but it's an example of what can be done by a, a, a low-income country which doesn't have a lot of resources, um, I mean, we know in the 1980s the pictures of uh, famine in Ethiopia and so on. Um, it's come a long way since then, and largely, I think, through political will to industrialize and to do what's, uh, what, what's needed for that. So it's not that it's a high tech. It's still a, it, a low-income country, low tech, but what we saw from those scatter plots is that for its level of income per capita, it has more high tech than would be predicted. So of course it's low tech compared to even South Africa, um, but it's, it's, it's got more high tech manufacturing as a share of GDP and employment than would be expected based on its uh, income per capita. Um, and I think there's different ingredients which have gone into that. One of them is the strategic use of uh, industrial zones. Um, so they have these huge like industrial parks. Um, and I think it's one of the, the important tools for in particular low income countries that are struggling to break into manufacturing and maybe you don't have the infrastructure for the whole country. I'm not talking about countries like Brazil. Okay? I'm talking about maybe low income countries that are trying to, they're knocking at the door of uh, industrialization. And you don't have the physical infrastructure, the digital infrastructure and so on to do it maybe countrywide. But they have these uh, in industrial parks with some massive factories. You'll find maybe 10,000 people working in a single factory. Um, uh, and when they built these, it was built by the government uh, with, a, with a green, uh, a green industrialization from the outset. So in terms of circularity and so on. I mean, it's not that I'm trying to glorify there's debates around you know, the, the wages are low and, 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 and so on, but it's, uh, it, it, it's having like a transformative uh, role in that economy. So it's one of the countries which has sustained like high growth rates um, over a period of time. So it's just an interesting case. It's not a perfect case, but it's an interesting case that industrialization is not a closed uh, route. Uh, th there's things which can be done uh, when, if you put strongly those policies um, in, into place. Of course, what's happening in, industrial in uh, Ethiopia is different from countries like Brazil or South Africa, where we've already deindustrialized and now the challenge is about reindustrialization and moving into um, high tech and so on. So it's not a one size uh, fits all, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so thank you, uh, Fiona. Uh, it was great. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.
so tomorrow we have uh, another presentation <laughs> of Fiona, uh, which are very excited. Uh, at nine, exactly. Uh, so we wait everyone. We also, uh, we're going to a restaurant, uh, so every, uh, right now, in the, it's a, it's a bar restaurant. Yeah. So everyone is invited, is in the corner of uh, Itapeva with, with Pamplona, where is the Intercity Hotel. So it's very close, one block, everybody is, is invited. Uh, I don't know the name. <laughs> no, but I, 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 I have it here, I have it here. It's the only, it's the only. No, direction of your hotel. So direction of the city, uh, not the police. Is it in the corner? It's in the corner, exactly. Okay. The door the corner. Next to the, the, the hotel, no, no, right? The yeah, yeah. Next, next to this new building. I know, I know. Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Even it's a stupid guy like, like me <laughs> know where he's <laughs> No, it's very close to that. It's very close to the hotel. Thank you. So yeah, thank you very much. I don't know if, if, where can I find uh, your works uh, more recently? Because I read some old works of you, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very aligned with what you're thinking. And, uh, my second question is, uh, I, I'm trying to, to, to make an approach to this uh, exactly the same using the, the database of the uh, Leon Tiet no, methods and also the input output for you. Because it's not, yeah, I, I think it's the same thing, but my class. Obrigado, fiquei yeah. feliz que você veio. A gente vai estar na mesma mesa, inclusive, acho. Isso, can, can, it's a... Uh, uh, no, no, no.